inaccurate in many words. So thanks, Nemanja, for your, your introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Wonderful to see you all. I, I recognize some of you from uh, previous encounters. So great to see, it's great to see you all here. Um, let me, through the magic of the internet, share my screen. So I'm not known for my beautiful and flashy presentations, very, very basic PowerPoint here. So my name is, um, is Lars, please call me Lars, L-A-R-S, Lars. And I'm speaking to you from Newcastle, UK, not far from the Scottish border. It's a cold and miserable day here and uh, wonderful to, to be in your company rather than getting wet on the streets. So here we all are. Academic writing is our topic. Um, I want to go through the aims of the session today. I want to explore the conventions and the process of academic writing at the graduate level. So that's the idea, to explore the conventions of writing, how one ought to write academically, but also to focus on the process of writing itself. You know, we talk about this in creative writing quite a lot, your writing process, what enabled you to generate work. But I think academics should also think about their writing process too. What enables you to, to generate academic work, whether it's MA students or as PhD students, I want to think about this, this, this academic writing as both a form, quite briefly, but also as, as a process at more length. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the, 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 um, the formal side of academic writing, what academic, uh, academic writing requires. We'll also talk about more about the process of academic writing. Um, and you know, the idea is to critically interrogate the relationship between the process of academic writing and um, production of dissertations, whether a PhD level or MA level. And in order to do this, I'm going to draw on this interesting new way of doing the philosophy of education, which is called weak philosophy of education. And the person whose name is most strongly linked to this is called Tyson E. Lewis. So we're going to draw on Lewis's work in order to explore process and outcome in academic writing. That's my general aim my lofty ambition today. The objectives discuss the challenges of the process of dissertation writing in depth. So what does it mean to write a dissertation? This could be a PhD dissertation, it could be an MA extended dissertation. And to investigate the, the language of aims and objectives. So think about what we're talking about when we're discussing aims and objectives of our work. I'm gonna refer here to Lewis and the weak philosophy of education. I'm also gonna draw on a literary uh, writer Robert Balser, who writes about study in his um, wonderful short novel Jakob von Gunten. And the method I'm following today, the way we're going to do this, is through elements of lecture where I talk at you, and also some elements of writing workshops. So you will be writing things down, jotting down ideas, and we'll be discussing those ideas together. That's the method we're going to follow. I want to talk about my credentials here. And the man generously put it in, 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 in the introduction. I've got lots of experience of supervising MAs and PhDs in different subject areas um, across philosophy, music, fine arts, creative writing, literature, and so on, and architecture. And I also award, I'm a part of, a part of these bodies that award money to people who are applying for PhD scholarships on the basis of research proposals. That's part of my job is to, to look through research proposals and award money, award scholarships on the basis of, of those proposals. You know, I have a general interest um, in the way in which university procedures, including academic writing, sit within the larger societal norms regarding what it means to produce, what it means to, to write according to means, ends, relationships, to try and begin to do a a PhD and finish it off. Norms regarding efficiency, what it means to be an efficient worker. Now the question here is whether one should be efficient at all. You know, what, what, what maybe efficiency comes with certain problems and issues. I'm interested in this question of technicity, of writing understood as a, te a technological art. And what does that involve? What does it mean? So those are some of my philosophical interests. 
I also have a pastoral interest in students with which I, with whom I work. So a general pastoral interest. I, I, I worry that some of these norms, these societal norms, are internalized by students overly, um, overtly too much. The students internalize some of these societal norms. And my worry is it can lead students to not completing their work, to episodes of depression. Um, this, is, this is a genuine worry of mine based on a lot of experience of working with students at MA level, at PhD level. If the students can find academic writing and the norms it reflects, the process of academic writing, they can find it something depressing, demotivating. It can, it can prevent students from, from writing something with which they feel fully satisfied. So that's, that's a general worry of mine is about the pedagogical side of, of writing long form dissertations, whether MA level or dissertation, uh, dissertation, PhD dissertation level. These are um, concerns which, which are pastoral. I think of them as spiritual in a very large sense, you know, in a broad sense, spiritual concerns about academic writing and what it involves, about study and what it involves, about learning. My worry is, as someone who's worked with many students over the years, is students can often internalize a model of what work means, what productivity means, what it means to be an efficient worker. They internalize it to such an extent, they fall short of their own ambitions, of their own motivations, of their own will. So I have a genuine concern about this. I want to try and alleviate this concern for those of you here today. So this idea of academic writing is not only about using the correct expressions, um, being able to, to write down your aims and objectives. It's also about this general pastoral concern with self-care, how you can get through this process of writing in such a way that you feel happy enough with what you produced. I'm interested in general in philosophy of education. And uh, this really interests me, particularly in the area of philosophy. I used to work in philosophy for many, many years here at Newcastle University. And we were concerned to try and develop novel techniques of um, assessment, of producing dissertations, which would try and address some of these concerns that I had about students being demotivated, students going off course, students feeling they, they were, they were constrain themselves. So we try to develop new forms of, of assessment, new kinds of writing for our students in philosophy. And we do the same actually in creative writing as well. We try to generate in creative writing forms of assessment which award students for work in progress, not just completed work, not just finished work, but for work that students are doing at the moment. So they don't feel that they have to polish everything up and, and make everything absolutely perfect in order to um, submit work and, and get, a, get, a, get a decent grade. I also have an interest, as Nemanja was saying, um, as a creative writer, someone who writes fiction, an interest in depicting academic life, and in particular the process of study, of thinking, of thought. This, this really interests me. And one of those wonderful things that happens when you write, you, you, you discover you have um, allies, you discover you have friends out there, people you don't actually know, but who feel like comrades. And that's why I felt when I first encountered um, this, this new school of weak philosophy of education. I thought, wonderful. I have people with the same concerns as I do. Actually, these people were able to articulate their concerns in a much more lucid way than I've ever been able to. So I was delighted to encounter the work of Tyson E. Lewis and other thinkers. I thought, here it is, what I've been waiting for. This really helps me to articulate what I've been trying to do in my creative work, which was to think about what study means, what long form, um, writing means in academia. I've just finished a um, novel, which is going to be published next year. It's actually on PhD students writing dissertations. So the whole novel is about what it means to write a dissertation, to understand this process of writing in a much broader context, where these students struggle with um, a narrow conception of what the productivity might mean, what efficiency might mean. They struggle with these things. And they understand writing in a much more general way, in a much broader context. This is a real concern of mine at a literary level, as well as a pastoral level, as well as someone who tries to innovate in, in terms of assessment and um, in the academy. I'm actually interested in writing about this creatively as well. I think creative writing is actually quite well suited to exploring some of these concerns which I have about the nature of academic writing. So we'll talk more about that as we, as we go on. We'll look at some literary examples 
of a depiction of education, drawing, you know, as I mentioned earlier, on uh, Robert Balson. So those are my credentials to give you a sense of where it is I'm coming from in um, talking to you today. So let's consider, first of all, academic writing as form. This will be a relatively brief discussion of the formal side of academic writing. Well, what is academic writing understood in these terms? A distinctive form of written work that draws on various conventions regarding structure, voice and language use. That's academic writing as a form. It's not so much rule-based as convention-based. So the rare conventions that you follow in academic writing and those regard structure, voice, language use, you all, you've been through your undergraduate education, you all will have a good general grasp of what this actually means. There's also the issue about academic writing as a process of planning, of structuring, of editing, of proofreading. All these things are part of the process of writing. I want to expand the idea of process even, even further, as we'll see as we continue today. I want, I want to expand that to something much more broad. I want to include daydreaming. I want to include um, wandering, uh, wandering outside, wandering through the library. I want to include general research, where research is not only about what's concerned, what, what's related directly to your project. It's about reading things that interest you, watching things that interest you, listening to things that interest you. So we understand that this process of academic writing can incorporate all of your lives as people who read, who watch, who listen, who think, all these things, all these affects. That the process includes everything you are as a human being, not just uh, the person who can marshal various skills of writing, and the whole of your life as a human being. That's the process of academic writing. I think of this as a spiritual process, you know, generally spiritual process. There are spiritual exercises you can do to help your work. It's about the whole human being, what you bring to academic study. And that's what I want to think about as the expanded notion of academic writing here, the extended, the expanded notion. Okay, so let's think of um, academic writing as a form, written in a formal style, academic writing, which means you present your work in a consistent manner. And this is the idea, if you're writing scholarly work, an MA dissertation, an MA essay, uh, PhD work of general of all kinds. The point is you're part of a community of scholars. You're part of people who have gone before you, who are now your contemporaries. You're part of a community who will be reading your work in the future. And the general idea in academic writing is you present your, your work, you, you present your results in a consistent manner, in a manner which anyone can pick up and understand and follow. So consistency here is what's crucial. And that's what you secure through the formality of writing, a formal style of writing. If you write in a formal way, then your work will be intelligible to people who read it straight away. They'll understand roughly what it is you're doing. So this idea of consistency is really quite important, especially uh, for people who are doing graduate work. As we say in the UK, postgraduate work, we call it postgraduate in the UK. So graduate work or postgraduate work it's presenting your work in a consistent style, in a formal style. The danger is, on this account, that informal writing can be too ambiguous. It can mean various things in various ways. The voice is too complex. The idea is in academia, you try to, 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 to present your work in a consistent, formal style. And as you'll know from your undergraduate studies, from studies you've, you've, been, you've been doing, you, you know, avoid words and phrases that we use in conversations, or in informal writings. You, you know, avoid slang, contractions, cliches like at the end of the day, casual words, really okay. What you're aiming for is precision. Precision. You're aiming to be precise and clear. You aim at specificity to avoid vague terms. If you're going to use jargon, then of course jargon is going to be very important. You know, if you're academic, jargon is part of what it is you do. You have to you use jargon. You try and define that. When you use jargon, you have to try and establish what you mean by this by, by jargon. In general, you aim at objectivity. You avoid exaggeration and overstatement. You support the claims you're making. You avoid emotive and grandiose language. As somebody who writes creatively, like fiction, 
I love writing emotion and emotive and grandiose language. Uh, that's what I do most of the time, you know, emotive and grandiose stuff. But for academic writing in general, these are things you want to avoid. Support all your claims, footnote, reference. Support your arguments with general evidence. Be careful of using overdramatic adverbs like really, really fantastic, really interesting. Make sure your work is well and appropriately sourced. Draw on credible text that you analyze or use as evidence. And this is the point here again about being part of a community. You are building on previous research. Academic writing is collaborative. There's a late essay by the writer uh, Maurice Blanchot who dedicates his work to, to friends known and unknown. The idea for Blanchot is there are unknown friends out there. There are people who he knows in his old age have taken up his work and done things with it. So our writing has friends, known and unknown. There are people who will take up our writing and do things with it, which are unexpected. We need to evidence our claims in academic writing. Be careful of drawing on appropriate sources. We're building on previous research. We're part of a community. Think of all those people who've gone before you. Think of all these writers who've gone before you. Think of all these incredible, hardworking people who produce these magnificent books that we, we draw on, that we admire, that we feel a great sense of gratitude for. And this sense of gratitude is what we, what we reflect in, such, in, in citing our sources. Thank goodness we're part of this community, a community of people we know and we don't know. We cite our sources appropriately, acknowledge when we quote people's work, when we paraphrase someone's work, we acknowledge this, we feel grateful to be part of a community of people who've gone before us, that we may disagree with many of these people as part of this community. We feel gratitude, but we want to also be reserved. We want to argue against various well-known positions in our subject areas. Fantastic. This is a community which, present, which, which tolerates dissensus, dissension, disagreement. Great. We feel gratitude, but we also feel a sense in which we have to try and Criticise people who have gone before us to take issue with ideas and arguments which are commonplaces now. Citation is vital. We, we need to produce work that is focused and well structured. And we usually begin with a clear statement of what we intend to argue and how we intend to establish it. Talking to you today, I've done exactly that. I tried to present a, se a sense to you what my aims were today, what I wanted to accomplish, what I intended to argue, and how I intended to establish those points. I stated my method to you. This again is part of the sense of being part of a community, a consistent method of, 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 the, of the presentation of your views. And so you have a, a, formal, a formal argument, a focused argument, introduction and conclusion, division into chapters if your work is you know, long, uh, transitional passages where you say, you summarize what you've done before, you signpost what you're gonna do in the future. All these things are familiar to you, I think, already. All of you will have a general sense of these, these norms, these um, conventions of academic writing. So all of you will have a sense of this already. I want to get to know you. I want to find out what perspective you're coming from. So with that in mind, I'd like to set you an exercise straight away, a five minute exercise, just to jot down, just to jot down, just off the top of your head, strengths and weaknesses that you feel you have with respect to academic writing as a form. So what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses? I want you also to think about how you might overcome those weaknesses. So five minutes, jot some things down, and I'll be talking to you about those strengths and weaknesses in five minutes time. So I'll stop you now. I'll stop you right there. Anyone care to share some strengths? Who feels strong in their build you right academically. Anyone care to share some strengths? It's always hard to volunteer for these things. Well, any volunteer, okay, let's, let's, let's go for strengths and weaknesses in that case. Strengths and weaknesses. I can tell you, I'm all weakness when it comes to academic writing. I'm all weakness. It's weakness all the way, all the way through. Anyone care to share some strengths and weaknesses? I guess I'll go. Thank um, you. Um, Mazia. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, tell me, are you an MA student, a PhD student? I'm a PhD student. And um, what, what field are you working in? I am, I guess, political science, essentially. Okay, political um, But science. it's more of an integrated studies kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I would say that my strengths are um, building off of the work of other people and um, collaborating uh, with their ideas and working against some of their ideas. Um, and I suppose I would argue that one of my biggest weaknesses is um, structurally the larger that a work becomes, the more incapable I am of wrangling it together. Yes, um, thank you very much. Wrangling your work together is a great expression. Wrangling. I think of horse riding, I think of cowboys <laughs> wrangling things. But Marzia, you say, you know, what you're good at is um, working off the, off, uh, building off the work of other people, this idea of building, making mm -hmm. something, it's constructive. You also work against people. Um, and is that something you feel is part, is that an integral part of your PhD writing? Yes, I do feel like it's an integral part of my PhD writing. I, I feel like I'm in debt to all of the people who came uh, prior to me and that if they didn't exist, I wouldn't be writing at all. Um, That's and I also that. feel- Go ahead, huh? please. Sorry, I, I interrupted, please carry on. No, go, go for it. You seem to want to ask a question. <laughs> oh, I was, I was gonna say, so you feel very much part of, of, of a community to which you feel in debt. But what would you say are the, um, are the, are the things that you want to work against? I mean, roughly to speak to a general audience here, we're not political scientists. What sort of things are things you struggle against in this field? I guess the idea that a lot of the research um, that was previously done on DACA focuses on, um, on immigrants as people who are inherently wrong. And it tends to use vocabulary that is um, sort of negating its own purpose. Um, and I'm sort of interested in looking at the ways in which these metaphors are um, negatively impacting um, immigrants. So yeah. referring to immigrants as illegal, for instance, even, even scholarship that positively talks about immigrants will sometimes use language that's harmful to immigrants or depict them negatively. So in some ways I'm criticizing that. And also I'm, I have to bring up a bunch of whole new things because I have to talk about the ways in which immigrants, DACA is like a new field of immigration in some way. And there's just not a whole lot out there written by people who have received a doc, uh, our DACAs. And so they're misrepresented in the same ways as say Native Americans or black people were in early scholarship. Uh, lacking and so I feel like I have to be that voice which makes me too emotional sometimes which is also a, yeah. a negative yeah. on my part. <laughs> sure so that this is fascinating so you actually got a new field of research here it's open before you you're a pioneer in this area with someone who's, who's um, doing something um, DACA is a new field of investigation you can draw on what's happened in the past and you talk about with, with respect to um, research on Native Americans but what you're doing here is, is doing something really quite new. Is it, is it nice to have that feeling of, a, of being, of doing something which involves a sense of justice? Yeah, I, I do feel like I'm doing something that's very meaningful, but it feels also incredibly painful. It's meaningful, um, it's painful, it's, it's emotional work you're doing here. Yeah, it feels like it, uh, when I'm talking about these stories, I'm talking also about my story. And that's why I feel like more than anything I've ever written, like my MA thesis was not about this. And so it felt somehow much, much easier to write. Mm, sure. Um, so this, whereas so, this feels yeah. difficult. So we're talking so, earlier yeah. about this idea of formal academic writing is supposed to be objective, but here is something which is a, a project um, which has a strong emotional content, talking about your story as well. It's not just the story of people in general, it's, it's your story too. Well, I, I don't involve myself in it, but it ends up happening that I project some of my emotion onto it because um, the, I am one of the DACA, you know? So yeah. I am in a sense, 
looking at research about people who are identical to me. So what a great perspective to have. You are studying your own experience in some way, maybe not explicitly, but you're nevertheless implicated in your research. And that contrasts with your MA work, which might have been more, I suppose, I don't know, it's just for, for want of a better expression here, objective or more detached from your experience. This is something in which you're entering into your experience. Of course, you're, th you're thinking about general structures here, you're pulling out from your own particular experience, but you're, you're, you're part of this, you're implicated. It's a great thing to be implicated in your own work. It has stakes for you, it's important. So it's, it's kind of scary. <laughs> it's scary, it's emotional, uh, but I sense that you get a sense of, of engagement, what it means to be passionately involved in something. So this is a, this is a passion project, which is uh, to be emotionally engaged is, is um, essential here. And do you ever feel a tension between the kind of prose you're writing and the experiences you, you yourself have undergone as a researcher? In, in a way, yes. I mainly feel the sense that um, it reflects me too specifically in that I tend to focus on um, mostly um, Mexican-American immigrants because the Latino community is like the largest. And in this way, I sometimes tend to engage in a kind of erasure of other communities. It's not intentional, but it's just like statistically based. Yeah, no intentional um, erasure of other communities, sure. So you bring, uh, you, bring, you bring to your work a kind of, you worry you bring to your work a kind of bias. Yeah, I'm a little bit worried about that. Mm. And how do you, how do you address these, these, these issues? Um, well, at the moment, I just do it by trying to read as widely as possible within my field. So to have like a larger grasp of it by focusing on um, other racial minorities within um, DACA. Uh, okay. concurrently that's ending up being black yeah, uh, okay. black migrants so looking at black migrants and their experiences so this wide reading would help you overcome any bias or limitation i mean all our projects academically are a finite thing they're limited they're perspectival we, we bring to them a particular perspective we try and address these things nevertheless they're always going to be partial in some way or another thank you very much um, you'll see me writing down notes as you speak I want to refer Thank back to you. these as, as we continue. Um, but thanks very much. Um, next person now, it's uh, let me get your name correct. How, how do I how to pronounce that? Uh, C A N G S. Genghis. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, somehow uh, <laughs> strengths and weaknesses come together, <laughs> most of the, like uh, in, in the same um, in the same issue. For instance, I I tend to write very fast, um, and that's somehow an ability not many people have, and um, but I tend to be not informal in the sense of, uh, I mean, in the end I will be formal, but the problem to, to get from what I have written very fast to a formal uh, present, uh, um, um, presentable um, um, uh, piece um, is quite, um, how to say it um, stressful to me so um, because like when I start writing I and I have a source um, okay, I make a note okay I have this I will find it later there um, to put it put it in um, but um, it's it grow when when the when the piece grows and grows and grows this is a lot I mean, this becomes a lot of work in the after, after afterwards. So, so this is for me quite stressful. Um, on the other hand, I'm always kind of proud when I kind of when I have a corpse, a body of, of work here. But still, there is a lot to go down. Yeah. And, what field? What field are you working in? Mm, well, I'm uh, my 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 uh, undergraduate uh, studies were sociology, so um, and I'm mostly focusing on on practice theory, uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, Andreas Reckwitz, um, the German sociologist. Mm, yeah, and um, focusing on citizenship um, procedures right now. Um, but that's not my PhD um, um, uh, yet, uh, so I have to kind of, uh, I still have to figure out uh, um, my research uh, question, basically, um, for my PhD. 
um, because I'm in a very early stage of my PhD. So, yeah, yeah. So you, you try you try to find your way to formulating a research question that would guide your work in the future. Yeah, mm. but but I have kind of my groundwork was basically on on, on, on practice theory. So yeah. What is this? Tell us a bit, a bit about practice theory. Tell us, as people who I, mean, I, don't, I haven't heard this expression before, what, what's, what's that mean, practice theory? Well, it means that um, um, ontologically um, or the, the social can be found can be found in in practice in in, in social practice. So it means that it is. Um, uh, and it's a, a it's always a knowledge based um, for it, it's not it's it actually distinguishes itself from from uh, um, American pragmatism, um, which is a school of mainly a school of acting. So practice and act, uh, acting is something different um, because I. Uh, it, it's it's an it's a it's not only a, a theory, it's not so much a theory as much as a program actually uh, a perspective um uh, for instance it, it distinguishes itself from linguistic perspectives um uh, from um, uh, uh, visual for instance uh, perspectives it's a uh, it it analyzes society from the standpoint of social practices me um uh, it's about uh, a practice is a, a tacit uh no, it, it is a. Um, it's based on tacit knowledge. It's 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 about incorporating knowledge and and acting out of it. Um, and it's not a, It's not an always intentional, strategic, or or um, um, conscious. It's it's a lot. A lot about it is um, is is unconscious procedures, um, and it's always this um, internalizing and reproducing. Um, knowledge and, and and it's not just it's not the movement of the body itself only it's also thought thought is part of the body so that's basically yeah. the uh, and, and there are differences are for instance um judith butler is also considered part of this in in some ways so it's it it, it, it is ambiguous in in terms of um incorporation of knowledge and performance of knowledge so it's a very ambiguous uh, theoretical approach so it, it, it's um and it it it, it, it um mm, uh, it always jumps from 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 the question of how stable and repetitive are our social practices and how creative and and and, and um um, um changing um, and performative subversive uh, practices are so that's Thank basically the, the umbrella of, 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 of practice theory that's well, very lucidly put so this idea of um tacit knowledge the incorporation of knowledge you know knowledge becomes bodily it becomes um, habitual we act out of this knowledge in some ways this presumably is a knowledge um knowledge how rather than knowledge of you know knowledge here is, is embodied it's not intentional, as you say, not strategic, not necessarily conscious. Um, we tend to internalize this, we reproduce it unconsciously. We're thinking here is part of the body. And do you do you, um, think of any, there's any tension between this notion of practice and the way in which you actually write? In what sense is your writing itself a practice? It is. Um, and, it, and I mean, there is, there is a, let's put it that way, that theory thinking and writing um is always considered something very intellect that the intellect is something um outside the body which isn't um and it's uh it's a very theory and practice is a very dialectical process actually so um, uh, and 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 theory is part of it is a form of practice. Let's put it that way. And, and 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 of course, research is not only theory, but the process of researching. Let's put it into the bracket of of, of theory mm, and thinking, like lying on the bed and thinking about I don't know Hegel, whatever, um, uh, and then staying, getting up <laughs> and and going to the computer and writing it down. That's that's uh, also a form of practice, and it's a very bodily practice. So um, as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. So this idea of where you lying on a, on a bed, the recumbent thinking, getting up, going to the computer, bending over, you know, writing these things. This is also part of um, of, of our understanding of, of, of thinking. Thinking is not just detached intellectual; it's embodied. It involves various uh, postures, various things we do. Thank you, Genghis, for sharing your your um, strengths and weaknesses there and your general reflections. Writing fast is an ability, uh, and then the problem of trying to find out where you got your stuff from, your sources. Uh, when you're writing inspired, you're working at some rate, it can be hard to go back and, and work out exactly where you got these ideas from. And yet you talked about your, your sense of pride when you, when you, when you finish a body, you know, when you constructed a body of work, when you've made a body of work, there's pride in what you've done, you've achieved something, accomplished something, there it is. Thank you very much for your reflections. And Jess, what were your experiences, strengths, weaknesses? Tell us, tell us first of all, Jess, about your um, your research. Uh, you, what are you doing research in? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Sorry, I don't have my camera on. It's very early where I am, so I'm in a. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I'm a PhD student here at EGS. I study, or I'm interested in, the constitution of consciousness, specifically models of consciousness that are more collectivity based, and how these. Um, are kind of juxtaposed with individualist and singular models of consciousness that I think are tied to, you know, colonialism and capitalist values. So my strengths, I think, are that I can write economically because I spent so much time writing 500 page statements for applications for master's programs and, you know, no word can go to waste in those situations. And I also already completed the master's thesis, so I feel well prepared to write the PhD, but my weakness is actually in, in, um, how to model or represent the concepts that I'm thinking through because I'm having a problem and I discussed this with my master's supervisor of finding the right language to express myself because the ideas that I'm working out about collectivity and everything are hard to represent in language like English that has a specific metaphysics of time already embedded within it and a specific idea of the individual. So there's cause and effect. You have the the subject, the pronoun who does the act, right? There's this, Judith Butler wrote about this in her master's thesis, actually, it's interesting. Um, but in other languages, there's a more collectivity-based representation, like indigenous Ojibwe language, the subject and action happen at the same time. So there's a disruption of the binary between um, like people and nature. There's other ways of communicating ideas that are more that go against these ideas of individualism and you know capitalist values and what the, and all the baggage that comes with those ideologies, right? So my problem is trying to represent collectivity-based ideas uh, within language that assumes the individual actor and things like that so I, there are writers that i can lean on um but it's tricky because the academic structure and form kind of assumes a specific style and it's it's difficult to to use those conventions when you're trying to write something unconventional i hope other, maybe others struggle with this as well thank you this is absolutely fascinating it's academic language itself uh, we have a notion of the of the I, of the self, of the individual, implicit there, as you say, a metaphysics of mm -hmm. um, the individual, a metaphysics of time as well, you mentioned there, a metaphysics of cause and effect. It's implicit in our English language. I imagine it's even more strongly expressed in academic language. And what you're doing, you're drawing on um, post-colonial uh, ways of, of reflecting on how individual consciousness is... is, is um, reified in English, how it's presupposed by English. And you mentioned um, indigenous language where subject and action happen at the same time. So this is this is extremely interesting and um, the way the way that you're, you're interrogating language itself. What authors are you drawing on? Who are you drawing on for help here in terms of articulating your 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 arguments? So mostly I draw on uh, Lucy Arigare and Mikhail Bakhtin. Arigare is um, she's a psychoanalyst and she she writes in a different way because she's a feminist. So she critiques Lacan and um, the male 
interpretation of language, which she calls the economy of solids. So she try she writes in a very, some would say esoteric way that's hard to understand unless you kind of study her work before kind of diving into it. Um, so she, she actually writes in a very, uh, it's a creative way, but it's not academic at all. Um, and then also Mikhail Bakhtin has a theory of dialogism where he critiques monologism, which is narrative styles and structures that are individualistic and, and um, kind of, he critiques this idea that consciousness is something that emerges through the individual. He believes consciousness emerges through our interactions with others and that those interactions and encounters are imbued with the socio historical and material conditions of each person. So it's a very um, historical materialist, a lot of Marxist authors cite him. Um, it's a very materialist, historical materialist way of looking at language. So it involves the body and it's a more collective uh, way of thinking. And he, he he's interesting to me because he also, he studies the novel and the different conventions that writers use through time. Yeah, this, this is wonderful. And thanks mm -hmm. for being so lucid. It's early for you in the morning, but this is a very lucid way of presenting um, the issues of your research here. So Rigore, as he's saying, she's often thought of as being an esoteric writer in most of her writings, um, someone who does not follow the normal academic conventions. Her writing is often extremely creative in the way she writes. In your own writing, are you able to be creative in that sense, in, 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 academic, in the academic setting? Not well, not really. Um, <laughs> when I was well, when I was writing my master's thesis, that was my main issue. Was I didn't have a problem coming up with ideas or or anything like that. It was just how do I, <laughs> how do I actually execute these ideas? Because I'm trying to talk about the, the the individual as part of a collective, but I have to use words that are just hyper individualistic. So I'm still trying to work through that. Um, but what I what I've been doing in my academic work is just using a lot of quotes from these writers who are established and are quote allowed to write more esoterically as it's been called. Yeah, so I yeah. just use quotes from other more established writers to bolster my ideas because you know I'm not allowed to write like that as such a junior scholar. Uh, you know I'm always told it has to be more academic form, etc. But you know I don't really no sometimes i think yes it's good to have that academic economical style because you don't want your professor whoever's reading it to have to read an extra 25 pages of you know whatever but at the same time like a rigorous style seems more economical in a sense because it the way she writes evokes more for me than some of the more you know conventional styles. I think sometimes writing more esoterically is more productive if you want to use capitalist terms. It is more useful and productive for certain people, especially different learning styles. A lot of people don't um, learn unless there's emotional associations with words. I have ADHD and dyslexia, so it's it's easier for me to learn by association if I have an emotional attachment to what's being written. I don't retain as much when it's strictly I guess, formulaic. Yeah, thank you so much. This is, again, it's one good loot here so, so, so early in the morning for you. <laughs> thank so you. This, this idea of something being allowed, something being permitted, that you, your position as a PhD student and everyone here, I suppose, you, you're all um, junior scholars in some sense, and you have to, in some way, earn your stripes before you go on to be able mm -hmm. to maybe experiment more with form. Think of Arigare herself as Speculum. Um, she published Speculum, which is it's not exactly a conventional academic dissertation, but it's it's more conventional than what she comes up with later. Yes. Yeah. So, but sharing cannot... the world, especially so one of her mm -hmm. later books, sharing the world, has been really informative for me. I wrote a paper on um, tra um, trans perspectives, and because they the writer Jay Prosser plays with queer temporalities, and it really the way that they were writing really disrupts the cause and effect. Um, metaphysics that are embedded within regular English structure. So um, between that, sharing the world, I recommend for, for a lot of people that are struggling with this specific issue. Yeah, thank you. And we have to think in general about the politics of the institution, about academia, 
and the kinds of writing it permits and does not permit. Um, these, these are interesting questions. So thanks very much, Jess, for sharing your thoughts there. Let me turn to, to Shirley. Shirley, tell us more about your, tell us about your, um, your researches. Hello. Um, so my background is in classical studies. And um, I think my strength within that space is I can be, I'm very specific and focused on my, on my scholarship around um, reclaiming, um, reappropriating stories, narratives, um, positionalities that have been um, uh, marginalized. So looking at um, race, gender, um, narratives around um, enslavement. Um, those are the pieces that um, justice work around that. Those are the pieces that that sort of resonate with me. So my, my weakness around that is um, how do I write? I'm a PhD student, by the way, this is my first year. So as I'm thinking about this process, I'm thinking about audience. And so how do I approach um, a multidisciplinary piece where my background is very specific? Um, how do I, I guess, um, how do I work through pacing? How do I work through ideas around um, like how much history do I add in? How much do I assume my audience members will, will know, say Seneca? Um, how, if I want to work in spaces around like um, comparative lit or history and philosophy, if I want to talk about Bakhtin to, you know, Timothy Morton, what, how do I work those, those pieces in without becoming too broad um, while at the same time meeting my, the needs of my audience, like the, the contextual, the contextual stuff. Yeah, it's very interesting. You're working here. It's not so much interdisciplinary, it's multidisciplinary, isn't it? You know, the multidisciplinary focus here is how you situate yourself with respect to an audience. Mm -hmm. um, so you have the question here about um, pacing, how much history you can include, what, what knowledge you can assume on the part of your readers. This is the first year of your PhD. So presumably your, your supervisor there is able to guide you in some respect, is able to steer you in the right direction. But what other ways can you try to address these weaknesses? Or potential weaknesses? Well, um, collaboration, of course, right? Um, mm. And even just um, reading what um, others are doing. I know that in the field of classics, um, it is a, a growing field in terms of encouraging um, more uh, multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary aspects mm. to it. Um, when I went through my master's program, there was some pushback in terms of the, the sort of generative um, spaces I was entering. Um, so like I would use um, Memembe's work, right? And there was only one other published author in classics that, um, that had used his work mm -hmm. and um, around like, you know, post-colonization and the effects of that, right? The iterative violence around that. And so um, I found myself struggling to find um, a mentor within that space, struggling to find um, works that I could use that, to help guide me. So, so definitely um, collaboration. I know in this, the space of EGS, I'm finding more and more individuals who can support that piece. So thank you. Um, and I also think another piece thinking about form is, um, and pacing, it would have to be the use of chapters. And so um, I'm not sure I've, I've never written something as lengthy as this. So I, 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 I foresee that as a struggle in terms of like um, my logical progression in terms of also meeting like audience needs and pacing. Yeah, yeah I mean, thinking here about your chapters, are you someone who likes to write long chapters? Or, or, I mean, I know it's only your first year, so you might not actually have a strong sense of how you want to write, but you know, how long are your chapters? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to work these things out. I mean, a PhD will often comprise three or four chapters, but there are other ways of writing. Mm -hmm. You can break down the, the long chapters um, in different ways. I mean, you can you can have short, short, punchy chapters where, where you can actually um, you can actually intercalate, you can actually um, move between something more rigorously theoretical and a more 
um, a more application-based chapter. Uh, there are various ways in which uh, we can work here. Um, do you struggle against what um, Genghis was calling internalization here? Do you internalize academic norms, do you think, in a way that's not helpful for your work? I'm sure I do. I also, I'm a high school teacher. I teach yeah. English language arts in the US. So um, uh, unfortunately it's it's very normative. Like this is, the, these are the things you need to know and this is what you have to do. And because I do it every day with like 180 students, I'm sure like it's just ingrained and in, this is what you need to do and this is how you need to do it. And so I'm, I'm looking also for ways to um, interrupt that process. Um, but again, I, I haven't seen as many models. And so um, I'm looking, I'm look, also looking for that. Yeah, okay, I understand that. So it's a question of trying to break out of this internalization. And what we need here, we need models, we need, we need things to inspire us. Um, Jess was talking about um, the rigore sharing the world. Um, we need models, we need people, we need exemplars. Luckily with EGS, you're, you're finding people who can support your work across disciplines. Um, but this question of, of models, of, exa of exemplars, um, that's what we need, all of us in our academic research. Mm -hmm. I wonder what's happening in this, anyway, I, I, we'll, we'll come to that later, about in, in, philosophy, of in the philosophy of education about, about, these, about these topics. Um, so Shirley, classic, classical studies, would I be right to characterize this as a, a, a conservative discipline? Oh yes, 100%, very conservative. Um, yeah. there's, there's some movement, there's some growing, there's some interruptions going on, but it's still a place where um, there's also just a lot of conversation of how do we, how do we the pedagogical um, intellectual problems um, that are manifesting within this discipline, um, which is actually really exciting that people are and institutions are having these conversations of um, you know uh, the source work, the uh, the lenses, the um, the actual language we use. You know the the sort of Greek miracle, um, you know Western civilization, the foundations of Western civilization, um, which are all incredibly problematic, but but rooted in the kinds of oppression that have become normative, um, and um, yeah, problematic. Yes, as you say, something which is um, it's exciting, it's frustrating, I suppose, in other ways as well. You're struggling against conservatism. These, these conversations seem to be happening, and let's hope there's a, a, a corresponding change in institutions other than the EGS, you know, where, where classical studies is being taught. But some subjects are very, very um, hidebound, you know. I've been in, I was quite involved for many years in, in music, in, in working in, in, in music as a discipline. And there's a tr slow transition at that time, this is 20 years ago now, I guess, um, into what music has become now. It's, it's, it's uh, broader, it's more multidisciplinary. Um, it's, it, it's some of the attitudes towards popular forms of music are, are, are falling away. So we live in a time of change, but this can be slow or fast depending. Thank you very much, Shirley, for, for sharing your experiences. And thank you, thank you, thank you for all of you so far for these, um, these experiences. These are extremely interesting. Let me now um, return to my um, my PowerPoint if I can. So I'll share my screen again. Um, where are we now? That's right. So we're looking at the form of writing. Um, so we're moving on to. Oh yes, let's have a look. Um, view slide share. That's right. From beginning. Okay. So you'll. Um, Obviously, what you're doing here is um, for improving your form aspects of your work. You're reading things, you're looking for models, you're looking for examples, you're looking for people who are blazing a trail. On the other hand, as junior scholars, you are normally required to be more conventional um, in the form in which you're writing. So you regard those people who have to learn to write in a certain way, which is a, a process of internalization. We see this in high schools, we see this in secondary schools. There's a, a great work of normativity going on here. Um, we're, being, we're being produced, we're being made into people who write in a certain way. You know, for getting through formal academic work, reading MA and PhD dissertations can be extremely helpful. I and mean, academic monographs can be a stage on from, from doing your scholar work. 
So if you're writing dissertations, read other um, PhD dissertations to it to it to um, see how it's done. Or the other way, in the other sense, that doesn't address the issues that Jess has already um, raised about the problems implicit in academic language, in in learning style, um, in addressing audiences who might actually engage more strongly if there's a strong emotional association with words and perhaps who experience things in different different temporalities, different relations of cause and effect. A style guide is always handy to keep by your side. Um, online guides to academic writing. I mean, there's so many good ones in a sense. I put good in inverted commas because they're, they're good at perpetuating standard modes of academic writing. Manchester University, Sheffield University, I was doing research for this, for this academic writing uh, workshop today, well, yesterday actually, or the day before yesterday, and uh, there's plenty of fantastic things in these areas up to a point, and there are academic writing books as well, which are also of use, but if you're working as, as you are, people we've spoken today, um, Marzia, you're talking about this as well, if you're working at the limits of a discipline, if you're breaking um, into new ground writing about Dakar, then you are doing more than perpetuating older forms of writing about academia. You, you, you're doing something which is, which is um, more, more akin to being a part of vanguard. You're doing vanguardist work. And uh, so academic writing books can also hold you back. And this is the whole issue about formal aspects of academic work, of academic writing. Um, it can form you, it can make you, it can produce you as an academic writer in a particular way, a way in which you have to struggle. I want to focus now moving away from form to thinking about writing, academic writing as a process. And the model here I'm going to use is, is dissertation writing. I'm thinking, of course, of PhD dissertations, but also of MA dissertations, longer form dissertations in, 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 on the MA. And this, of course, is the most rewarding and challenging form of writing, maybe at this stage in your career at academics. Um, this long form investigation is no longer a response to a preset question. Jing, as you were saying, you were actually looking for your search question. That's kind of a wonderful thing about that. You're writing to look, you're looking for the question that you're then going to write in response to. It's that curious temporality of, of academic research, where what you're often doing is trying to find your way to a beginning point. You're struggling your way to a point at which you can actually begin and actually find the question that will then allow you to launch forth and in your academic writing. So a curious temporality. You're never quite sure um, it, you know, what you're doing. You're trying to find a research question. You're never quite sure what that question might be, according to um, this is Jengis, this is your experience, as, as I understand it, as you, you were telling us all about. Um, and you're trying to find your way to that question. It's not just a given for you. So that's why, hopefully, dissertation writing is exciting. And that, what I was trying to do, I was telling you earlier about being a, trying to be an innovator. When it came to academic writing, when I used to work as part of philosophy, we would get the students to try and come up with their own questions in their research, uh, even as undergraduates, to try and generate their own questions in collaboration with us as, as members of teaching staff, but to try and generate their own questions so they weren't just writing set pieces. And back in those days in philosophy, we would try to say to the students, look, philosophy is something which should be brought to bear on things outside of philosophy. So rather than writing set piece essays about, you know, which are based on, I don't know, Kant's categorical imperative and its strengths and weaknesses, we encourage our students to write dissertations in all three academic years, even in the first year, to go out into the world and find things to philosophize about, and not only to write about them as an object, but to allow them to change the very way in which you write your work. And what we encourage our students to do was actually model on creative writing. Because in those years, I remember meeting someone who, from creative writing at an academic party, at a party, and then um, I was asking her, how do you assess work in creative writing? And she said, well, what we did, what, we, what, we, what they used to do in creative writing, we assess the essay in which students reflect upon their practice, and we allow them to write what they want. When I was working in philosophy, what we used to do is get our students to write notes, to write in note form, to write in diary form, to write in whatever form they wanted and then to write a commentary on their research, which framed it in more academic prose. Um, and that's something that I, I do think about um, as, a, as, a, as a way of working. That's what we do now in creative writing here at Newcastle. On some of our modules that we teach, we assess our students not on a finished piece of work, 
but on notes, on inquiries, on often you know handwritten notebooks or, or you know um, notebooks into which people have have, have put in pictures, have, have glued things, you know, and made, made a, a work of art. And we, we, we assess them on their reflections on their process of research. That's something which I hope can, can spread more, more widely in academia, because that would maybe permit these different approaches to help us overcome these internalized norms that are all part of us. Anyway, the point is, the dissertation at least goes so in some direction towards this. As junior researchers, we get, you know, you get more of a sense of autonomy, um, a way in which you can formulate your own research question, find your way to your research question, hopefully a research question which resonates with you emotionally. There's some emotional importance here. You're implicated, as Marcia was talking about, you're implicated in the research in some way. And of course, um, the dissertation helps you negotiate your position with respect to existing academic literature, to distance yourself with from some of these norms, from some of these assumptions, from the way in which um, things are done in your, in your disciplines, which may be more or less conserved depending on what this thing you're, you're a part of. And of course, your supervisor is there to help and, and guide you in this. I want to talk about aims and objectives, um, establishing the scope and direction of your work. I struggle with even setting this as a, as a topic and even thinking about this because Again, there's a, there's a normativity built in here. There's a way of, 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 um, of presenting your work, which is convention based. On the other hand, and Jess, you were talking about this, if you're making a bid for to get funding at any level, at the MA level to get a scholarship from MA, a PhD level to get funding for a PhD, you need to present your work in a particular way, which is a standard way of presenting your work. So I want just to go over this with you. You may be already familiar with this, but let, let me just go through this again. The aim is your overall intention in your project, the broad statement of the main goal of your research. It's clear, it's specific, what is to be achieved, but it's, it's broad, it's ambitious. And you want to indicate here why what you're doing is important, uh, what the point of you doing the research is, uh, so the aim in this project is, you're acknowledging the partiality of your research. You're, you're, you know, you're acknowledging that you know, in the humanities and the arts in particular, we're, we're alert to the fact that we bring a particular perspective to our work. So that even though we might feel implicated in our field within which we're working, nevertheless, you know, we know that there may well be biases. We can try and address these through our reading, through reading about black migrants, for example, and, you know, as Mazia was discussing. But nevertheless, there are biases here. And that's something we can indicate in the language we use to understand, to explore, to critically interrogate um, these infinitives. Normally one or two aims only, one sentence to one paragraph long. It's a great art, writing a statement of aims. It's, it's a hard thing to do. You may well, many of you here, be already acquainted with this art. It's something you ne can never leave behind you. If you get an academic uh, job, then you'll be putting in bids, I would have thought, for funding of various kinds, maybe for promotion, even in your job application for an academic job, you need to be able to state your, your um, research clearly in terms of an aim or a couple of aims, and of course, an objective. Objectives are the steps you need to achieve your aim. Your aim is about, it tends to be more about the what, what you intend to establish. A statement of thesis, where thesis simply means position. You know, what is your position? What, what position are you trying to reach? An objective is, it's more about how you intend to achieve that aim. It's more about method. Method simply means, well, but method etymologically, path. What path are you going to follow to get there? And typically, you divide your aim into smaller parts, and each part should have its own purpose. So how will you achieve your aim? This usually comes as part of a numbered list. In order to achieve this aim, I will, one, provide readings of, two, analyze accounts of, and we have an active use of language here, typically in objectives, more active use of language. And objectives are typically more, are more precise than aims. Um, we move from the aim is to understand to, I will uncover the notion of feminine writing at play in a particular text. So they're more achievable and, be, and can be clear and can clearly be completed you know, in a simpler way. The aims are more general, they're more broad, they're more ambitious. Objectives are more concrete, more particular, more precise. And that's tend to be how you break down aims and objectives. Um, again, you know, 
I, I sit on these um, committees where we award funding for PhD studentships. We all reward three year three years of funding, and these are decent enough awards. They're not, not generous awards, but they're enough money to live on. And what we're doing there is looking through our applications, and you know most of them are not even getting to the um, look at you know not even get to that stage where we're taking them seriously. Uh, typically, typically the case we, we might get I don't know 150 applications. And of those, only 10% uh, are able to present their aims and objectives in a standard, conventional, academic way. And of those, normally it's a smaller number than that who would even, would even really consider for funding. And normally it, we, we get we down to about five, really, out of our applications, which then we'll put a lot of work in. We put a lot of work into to try and um, work with their with the uh, writers of these applications to try and improve their work. That's what we do before we actually submit the work to um, to our panel, which which where money is awarded, we actually help our students. So these things are, are really quite important skills, and conventional as they are, they're very useful, um, very useful things. Aims should be broad, but not too broad. Objectives should be specific. Aims concern the overall ambition of the project. They should be they should be distinct from the objectives. Not the same thing over and over again. Aims and objectives should, surely con, con, should clearly connect. And the language of, of objectives tends to be define, discuss, critique, summarize, apply, develop, review, evaluate, challenge, interpret, argue. So these are the kinds of um, feedback that I would give, or that we as a, as a panel will give, to people who have applied for us for funding. We would say to them, your aims and objectives do not clearly connect. Your aims um, were not ambitious enough. Your objectives were not precise enough. You know, these are the kinds of things we're using as um, criteria as criteria to reject applications made to us, and we we, we actually give feedback to a lot of our applica applicants, not to all of them, but to the ones who have come quite close to achieving their um, their aim in, in getting funding. We'll give them feedback, and the feedback is almost almost always the same: um, that maybe the students haven't been realistic about what they can achieve, maybe the language isn't quite right, aims and objectives don't connect strongly enough, the ambition is not there. We're not aware as people looking at the, at the applications of what the stakes of the project are, why the project is important. You need to make a case to the, to the panel awarding you funding, why your project should concern, concern um, other people, why, why it should be funded. So these are things, these, these are the standard feedback which I give and the panel of which I'm a part gives. Every year we give the same kind of advice out and these, this is the general, these are the general things we say, this sort of stuff. Um, what have I got now? Yes, here we are. General tips and um, hmm. I seem to be stuck in a peculiar loop. Yes, here we are. Now, we give you an example of a monograph published from a PhD: Keith Crone, Leotard, and Greek thought. This is the language used. The aim of this book is to examine Leotard's uh, interpretations of sophistry. In part, it's my intention to show that Lyotard's concept of the different is articulated by way of a positive appropriation of sophistry. For reasons that I'll make it apparent in what follows, this I hope will in itself be of some importance in continuing study of Lyotard's work and the viewpoint appreciation of its philosophical significance. Beyond this, however, my intention is to demonstrate that Lyotard attempts to determine the possibilities and limitations of philosophy as such by way of an interpretation of its relation to sophistry. This is an example of a, um, of a book, a monograph that's published from a PhD. The PhD dissertation was published as a monograph by a decent enough publisher, a you know, prestigious publisher, and um, Keith Crone won his PhD funding on the basis of an application which looked, looked like this. So that was his application for funding, which he won. He successfully got through his PhD, uh, did very well, and his PhD was published. And this is the kind of active language that he's using. In his, um, in his work. And that's what got him his funding, that's what got him a publication deal and an academic job. It's the, the way in which he's writing active prose, um, active ways of writing, an indication of the state of his project. So you can find these sorts of things in PhDs, have a look at other people's dissertations, uh, MA dissertations, see what we see what succeeded in the past. I want to set you an exercise. It may be something you're, you've already done. If you've done it before, think about it again. Clearly state the aims and objectives of an academic project. It could be a real one, it could be an imagined one. 
hopefully something you're working on at the moment. What, if anything, might prevent you from achieving your aims and objectives? So think about this again, the idea of obstacles. How might you address these obstacles? What we're doing now in this exercise, we're thinking internal to the current system of academia as it is. In our previous um, exercise, we talked in more general terms about an issue some of you raised here, an issue about how we incorporate ourselves, literally incorporate and set our bodies into current academic practice. This exercise is much more pragmatic. How can you present your work within academia as it currently is, such that you might successfully pass your PhD or your MA, or that you might get your work published as a PhD dissertation, or maybe later in your, on your career, get some research funding. So please, 15 minutes or so, um, aims and objectives, considering how you might object to any, and how, how you might address any obstacles that, that um, you might meet on the way. So if we stop things there, anyone care, if someone hasn't spoken before, anyone care to share their aims and objectives? Any volunteers? It's always hard to volunteer for things. Anyone care to talk about their project, their aims and objectives, obstacles? It may well be that you're not quite there at the stage where you can articulate a research question. It's always a hard thing. Any volunteers at all from the, from the group? It's a tough thing. <laughs> The general aim. How about general aim? I'd love to hear a general aim. Anyone care to share a general aim with the group? I can share. I'll share. Go right ahead, please. Thanks, Shirley. Yeah. So this is actually for um, an actual project that I'm working on. Um, it's called the Politics of Dissimulatio in Seneca's Thyestes. So my aim is, um, this paper aims to consider, so the questions I pose, I should start with that is, what should one do with political grief? How does political loss, trauma, and annihilation create a spectral space of deferral? So um, this paper aims to consider these questions as it explores the literary and political notions of memory, inheritance, and melancholy in Seneca's Thyestes. And I was very inspired. I had a, um, a seminar with Avital Ronell earlier this summer and um, the work there that was shared um, inspired the work here so um, so that's my that's my aim right okay, now okay great so general aim here you're looking at a particular text which you mentioned you got the memory inheritance and you use the expression political grief mm -hmm. now would that be linked to would that be a part of this claim about the relevance of your work that, it, that this is something important and states of this work are trying to deal with something which is a, 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 a broad phenomenon today, this idea of political grief. Yes, so it's drawing connections. I'm, I'm using, so this is the beginning of a project. So I'm using um, Seneca's Thyestes to comment on the ways that people, um, so dissimulatio is um, a Latin term, and it's used to describe this mental phenomenon where one conceals one's thoughts and feelings by displaying sort of these sort of feigned sentiments, like everything's going to be okay, but really there's um, a great sense of melancholy. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at this particular text and some of the exchanges between um, a ghost and um, a fury and um, hoping to create some commentary around um, some of what's going on today. <laughs> and it's something which, if, you, if I think of Abital Ronell's published work, it's something she does so well in getting these texts from very unexpected places and getting them to talk about contemporary concerns in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and your work, when you, state, when you state your aim, you're explicitly saying this work is, is, is to do with political grief. And here it is, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna develop these notions. How about breaking out those, those aims into objectives? Do you have a clear sense of what the objectives might be? Yeah, so I, I did write, so I said, by examining these concepts through the lens of ontology, 
This paper will highlight Seneca's nostalgia for a political past, one grounded in the manifestations of a Republican memory and inheritance by closely reading the exchange between the ghost of Tantalus and the Fury in Act One of Thyestes. Um, such expressions of nostalgia manifest a hyper-ethical text that shed light on the relationship of myth, stoicism, and Roman political memory. This project works to eliminate a practice of melancholic um, dissimilatio in ancient Rome that speaks to the intersection of representation, knowledge, and political action. Sure, okay, that's great, thank you. And this seems very, very clear. Um, and is there a statement that, you know, you've got, you've got the idea of reading things through the lens of, of pauntology. So the idea that here is the method is a close reading, and mm -hmm. then you're, 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 this close reading is informed by hauntology. That's your, that's your method of reading. Also, this, the method is the word we use here. There's problems of using the word method, but we'll use that word here today. Um, and that's, that's clearly stated. So your audience has a good sense of what it is you're up to here. Obstacles. What are the obstacles do you think might come up with respect to your work? Um, well, the, <laughs> the first piece is time. <laughs> mm. You know, like, and, and that that might be a, a me thing. You know, like, how do I how do I do all the work that I need to do? Um, I find myself going into these rabbit holes of like, I need to read more. I need to read more. I need to read more, which I think I do. Um, and at the same time, I also need to write. So I'm just trying to balance that, that piece of um, exploration, um, you know, trying to, to, to articulate my understandings in some more nuanced ways. So I guess, you know, that's, that's the reading, the reading, the reading. Um, and then another obstacle would be, um, Again, like this go, going back to audience, um, how much do I um, write about Neronian politics? How much do I, um, how much space does, you know, should I speak to Seneca's um, ideologies around um, stoicism and myth? Um, so yeah, I'm not, the, the obstacle I think would be like how much, um, effort do I put in these different spaces to to create um, momentum? Yeah, yeah. This is momentum with, with respect to your own work and actually computing it in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly, this, I mean, any of us face the same problem. Um, a perennial problem which I, I, I was facing in doing scholarly work is simply reading too much. I have to read everything on the subject and I read too much. As you say, there are rabbit holes down which you can, you can plunge, you know? And um, Christopher Zimmerman, you're saying reading can be a way not to write. Absolutely true. I mean, writing can be arduous and reading is can be wonderfully pleasurable. It can lead in all these different directions at once. It, it's fantastic. So certainly as a problem which I always faced is um, doing too much reading, taking months and months and months and months of reading. I mean, it's madness. So how do you balance that with writing? This is, this is absolutely crucial. It's a really, really important question, which all of us will face. How do you balance the two? How do you make time to, to write in an appropriately nuanced way? And that's what you're saying, um, Shirley, articulating your understanding in a, in a nuanced way. Then the question of how much does the audience know? How much do you presume the audience knows? What do they know about the politics of Nero? What do they know about Stoicism and Seneca's relationship to it? So again, this is a, something all of us to struggle with. Um, what audience are you writing for? Uh, when I think of these things, I'm thinking of journal articles I've written, and you get the referees' reports back from the journal articles saying, you know, um, the audience will already know this stuff, or can you amplify this for, for the audience in question? The rabbit holes, I think, of all the things you mentioned there, is um, something that I can certainly um, relate very strongly to. And the question of how you do the work that you do, you know, you're working as a teacher, you've got your other things going on, how can you find the time in which to do this? Just actually mapping out that time and organizing yourself is already um, very difficult. Any other, um, any other aims, objectives, anyone else would care to share their um, stuff they've just written over the last 15 minutes? Any, anyone, there? anyone else at all? Never easy. How about, uh, we go for an aim. I want to hear an aim from somebody, an aim from someone here. An aspirational, open-ended, 
broad aim. Anyone care to volunteer an aim? So what we're doing here is internal to academic politics, internal to academia as it currently stands, articulating these aims and objectives. I mean, I would map um, aims and objectives in it. I'm not quite sure how to map them onto research questions. This, this phrase research question is something which is, for me at least, relatively new. I mean, I haven't, I've, I've encountered it in, in recent years, but it's a relatively new way of looking at things. But the idea is always to have some research question animating your work. I've had very unfortunate situations where as a yearly, um, um, and, you know, as a yearly monitor of people doing PhDs, where students will come in and discuss their work with us, uh, with the panel, to, to talk about how well they're doing. We've had, you know, very unfortunately, we've had to say to some PhD students, you know, you, you really can't continue any further, because after a couple of years of doing your PhD, we still don't see as a panel, there's, there's a, a sufficiently strong aim and objective, um, a sufficiently strong sense of um, research question behind your work. So there's all that sense of an animating question, something which drives your work, which pushes it onwards. And it's essential to articulate that, particularly at PhD level, but also MA level. Now, what is the question driving this? What is it that's propelling you through this work? What is it that organizes your work in advance you know, by dint of it addressing this research question? And, you know, correlated with that, breaking down your overall aim into clear, measurable, feasible objectives which may or may not map onto different chapters of your work. So having that strong sense of structure of the form in which your work will take is reassuring for your supervisor, the people who are inspecting your work on a year by year basis and can help your audience situate what, what it is that you're doing with respect to your work. Anyone care to volunteer and volunteer an aim? Anyone feeling emboldened? Emboldened enough to talk about perhaps obstacles to your work? If you don't just share will, your aims objectives. Put myself into the fire. <laughs> please do. I can't see. Where, where are you on my screen? I'm here. here. I'll turn on my camera. I'm sorry. Um, one second. Can oh, there see? we are. Kirsten, yeah, great. Thank you. Tell us about what you're, what you're working on. What, what Are you a PhD student, MA student? I am a, I'm a first year PhD. Mm -hmm. um, so just I'm still in um, what I find to be a very exciting exploratory stage. Um, and I will tell you my aim, if I can read through all of my scribblings, <laughs> um, and this, this will probably change and grow over the next year. Um, so my aim is to expand um, on Amber Schoon's theory in her book, Quantum Art. Um, I will explore the question Schoon puts forth, what is the art that the being of art itself desires? in conjunction with Baudrillard's proclamation that art is null. Um, and then my intention, um, which is kind of, I didn't get a chance to really nail this part down yet, um, is to, I want to address the questions that come along with the afterlife of art. Great. The afterlife of art. You know, if I were looking at this as a, as a research application, that, that is such an eye-catching phrase. I'd have that right at the beginning. I'd have that right up there um, okay. with the aim. It's such a, so eye-catching. And with that expression, you're showing what the stakes of this might be. So you're already making it, your audience interested in this idea of an afterlife of art. It's fascinating. And then you're also indicating, um, using this phrase, if you could expand on, on a little, you're indicating the stakes of your research, why it's important. So you talk about your expanding on, is it Schoon's theory of quantum art and Baudrillard's proclamation of the, of the end of art? Um, yes. If you were to try and state this, if you want to explain to an audience, why, why is this actually important? What, what are the stakes of this? Um, well, the thing that, the, the, the thing that quantum art discusses is, which is, as an artist myself, something that I also um, hold to is uh, the idea of the art market um, and its association clearly with um, capitalism. Um, so the quantum artist rejects, not rejects, I would say, acknowledges, but then ignores the art market. Um, 
And then I guess along with the idea, you know, Baudrillard is saying art is null, um, when something is null, that doesn't mean it's necessarily dead or gone. It just has, no longer has any value. Um, so, you know, the big question is, which also was in Schoon's book is, you know, what, what are we doing? <laughs> um, you know, the afterlife of that, like if the art market is no longer alive for the quantum artist, you know, ideas of what are we doing, ideas of, um, she discusses entanglement um, and the responsibility of the artist as an entangled being. Um, Wonderful, thank you very much. So this is great, the stakes of this are really clear now, you, you, the way you put this about the relationship to the art market. And what's interesting here is that you are an artist yourself. Is this, is this a, a dissertation which, which is in, um, in history of art or the fine arts, is it, does it have any um, creative um, element? Can you can you say that again? I'm yeah. not sure. Is the this uh, uh, what what feel is, is your is your dissertation um, situated within? Um, yeah, I'm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm. You know, I'm still so so new here. Um, I suppose I don't know. Does it does it have a creative component? In the sense um, of the would we submit any creative work as part of the as part of the dissertation? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I wasn't I didn't even know that that might be an option. Um, I just, you know, everything that I do has to do with everything that I write. Um, so yeah, so this, this, is, that, is that part of the idea of entanglement? It's, it's all of a piece. Yeah, yes, mm. everything is completely connected. This is the idea that came up earlier. I think it was um, with Jenga's this idea of incorporation of the body and, and, and thinking being part of the body and um, the, the, the idea which came up earlier again of a, of a thinking practice or practice practice thinking is part of a general practice so all of these are part of the same kind of activity but most of your work Kirsten takes a form of academic prose that's how you're seeing it at the moment is that is that correct yeah for sure I mean as you know as an artist and you know with my MFA and um and my BFA I did have to do a a good well, a good deal of writing, but it was definitely less strictly academic. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Great. So anyway, so your obstacles. What do you think might hinder your progress here? Um. I guess the the question. I mean, is not is not going to be answered. <laughs> so how do you take an almost unanswerable question and you know, satisfy some of the curiosity, I guess. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm using the right words for what I mean. Um, I, think, I think an aim, when we say an aim of a, of, a, of a piece of work, the ambition that's part of that aim is the very fact it's unanswerable. The question is so large, you can't really answer it, but you have a yeah. go at answering it. And that's what the objectives do. The objectives break down how you might try and address it. But an aim of a general um, thesis and um, perhaps a research question um, can be something which is not really answerable in any, in any obvious way in its entirety. And your objectives delineate approaches you might take to try and address that question. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about your, your, your exploratory stage of a PhD, and certainly in, in stage one, the first year of a PhD, it's exploratory. You're finding your way to the brink of a, of a, of a research question. You're, you're finding your way to that question. It's one of these curious things about um, practice of any kind, um, whether it's intellectual explicitly or creative, you're never quite sure what you're doing for quite some time. And at mm -hmm. a certain stage, you can step back and say, this is what I think I'm doing. This is where, this is the direction in which I think my work is going. Um, this is the, uh, my, my curiosity, to use that word, Kirsten, you used, is drawn in this direction. So at a certain stage, you take stock and you translate what you're doing into more conventional academic terms of aims and objectives. You step back at that moment, say, this is what I think I'm doing. I've reached the point now where I can actually make a, a statement at least to the question that I'm trying to address, even if that question is unanswerable. So hopefully the language of aims and objectives can help at that stage crystallize what it is you've done until that moment. 
And one of the ways in which I always think about this is when we're engaged in projects of various sorts, we're not quite sure what we're doing until we're able to look back at our progress, at the path we have followed um, until now, to look back at our progress, look back at what we've done as what we might think of as a, as a reject. So a project, throwing something forward, a reject, something that lies behind us. And at that moment, we're not saying it's, it should be discarded, but it's something which lies behind us. We can look back at it and say, this is what it is that I'm doing. Now I understand what it is I've been up to. This was a path, and the path was leading me here. It was leading me to this moment. And this is why I think that that, that stage at the beginning of a PhD, or the beginning of an MA, MA dissertation, is exciting. It's a sense, of, a sense of potentiality, which hasn't yet been closed down, which hasn't yet been translated into any particular determinate act or action. And that's what I want to talk about in the second part of today's workshop, is that relationship between potentiality, excitement, exploration, and what we actually end up doing, how we translate this excitement into a determinate project. So that's what we're going to move into in our second part of the, of the workshop. We're looking at potential um, and the way in which potential relates to action. And it's really a way of rethinking aims and objectives, trying to, trying to think of aims and objectives at a more deep philosophical level. So we're going to think about um, potential and the translation of potential into action, what is gained thereby, but also what is lost. What is lost when we pass from that exploratory moment to a determinate project, when we work out what it is we're doing and we're focused on something, what is it that is marginalized? What is it that is excluded at that moment? We have a few minutes left, not many uh, minutes really, I suppose. Is there time for a final aim from anybody? Perhaps what we could do, given there's only five minutes according to my, to my clock here, we'll leave things till the second part of today's session. So thanks very much, um, all of you, for, for being here and listening to me. And thanks for all of you participating in the discussion. We'll continue later on. Um, I look forward to seeing you all later this afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's have a look. So part two of our uh, workshop today, <clears throat> the last exercise I asked you to do, I said you should, you should clearly state aims and objectives of an academic project. And I asked you what might prevent you from achieving your aims and objectives. I asked you how you might consider addressing these obstacles. In the second part of today's workshop, I want to ask this question, or these questions. What if the very language of achieving aims, objectives, and obstacles, what if that very language is problematic, perhaps even misconceived? What if the process of academic writing needs to be rethought? Um, is there a way of rethinking academic writing outside of the language of aims and objectives and obstacles? So I've given you the, um, the view from within academia, the view from within contemporary academia, today's academia, I've given you that view so far of someone engaged in um, supervising students and assessing students and um, trying to award money to students who, who are looking for scholarships. So what I've done is look, look at this whole issue from the inside of academia and from present academia. Is there a way which we might want to pull away from present academia to rethink what it means to write academically beyond these notions of aims, objectives and obstacles? So this second half of today's workshop will give us all an opportunity to rethink how academic writing sits within the academy, um, how this process of academic writing might be rethought, how we might rethink uh, how academic writing and its whole process might work within academia. So here we have an opportunity to, to, to think about how things might be changed. And our partner in this is, in general, what is called the weak philosophy of education the weak philosophy of education. And this is a, a new way of thinking 
which you find in educational philosophy. The philosopher I'm drawing on here is uh, Tyson E. Lewis, and his book is called On Study, Giorgio Gambon and Educational Potentiality. It's one of many books he's written, a very interesting book. And there's a whole bunch of these individuals involved in um, weak philosophy of education. There's Tyson E. Lewis himself in On Study and also in Inoperative Learning. Samuel D. Rocca, um, Gert Viesta, John Ballacino. These are all people who are, who Tyson E. Lewis allies with weak philosophy of education. It's interesting if you read um, Tyson E. Lewis as a as a writer, what he does is to distinguish his position very, very carefully from those people who are allied to him. So what he'll do is quote a bit of Samuel D. Roche's book and say, well, actually, I agree with Samuel D. Roche up to a point, but my point is slightly different from that. My point is a little more nuanced. Or you might say, Geert Biesta says things in a very interesting way, but, you know, my worry is that, I, and that Biesta still gives a bit too much away to this um, to strong uh, notions of education. So the way in which Tyson E. Lewis writes his book is a very instructive one for anyone writing an MA or a PhD. It's instructive because you can work with writers who are very, very close to your position, and you can articulate your position by showing how you differ from them in, in small ways. So you can assemble around you a bunch of people who are really quite sim similar to you, who are doing something pretty analogous to what you're doing, but then you can say, well, actually, I disagree with them on this point, on that point. And that's how Tyson E. Lewis works, which is rather, very instructive, I think, in terms of academic scholarship. You see Derrida, Derrida, Jacques Derrida, doing something similar in uh, writing Indifference. He writes about a lot of thinkers who are very, very close to him in many ways, you know, so close to him in so many ways. Yet he also distinguishes himself from them very, very carefully, in a very nuanced way. It's a great tactic to use um, as academics. Anyway. Um, educational philosophy is allied with a book you might know, uh, Fred Moat and Stefano Harvey's book, Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, it's achieved a, a, a lot of attention um, in recent years. Moton and Harvey, the authors of the Undercommons, actually contribute a, um, a foreword to Tyson E. Lewis's book, Inoperative Learning. So it's quite interesting, the connections between the, these areas. And educational philosophy in general, I think in its strongest, well, I shouldn't call it strongest form, that's a contradiction in terms, the educational, weak educational philosophy in its most, in its most persuasive form, i.e. in the work of Tyson E. Lewis, draws extensively on the work of um, the European Graduate School uh, professor, uh, Giorgio Agamben. So Agamben's work is drawn extensively upon in Tyson E. Lewis's work, as we see from the very title, On Study, Giorgio Agamben and Educational Potentiality. And Lewis makes a good case that Agamben is the philosopher to draw on when it comes to thinking about um, what studying might mean, what it means to be a student, what it might mean to uh, reclaim or to honor potentiality. So Agamben lies behind all this stuff we're talking about. But rather than looking at Agamben's work, you know, which is very dense and quite tough to read, I thought we'd go for Lewis rather than Agamben. I prepared some slides on Agamben. I thought, my God, this is. It's very difficult to teach this in um, two hours, so let's go for Lewis instead. And Lewis is very interesting because he gives you a lot of examples. He, um, he shows you weak philosophy of education in action um, in the classroom, in the schoolroom. So that's why I thought his work is a better thing to present you with rather than the Gambon himself. OK. So let me go through some, um, some key notions in not just weak philosophy of education, but notions in contemporary thought, which I think are, are, are useful. And what I'm doing here, I'm actually quoting from Tyson E. Lewis's work. So I'm quoting from his work, um, and I will comment on, that, on those quotations as we go through them. So what Lewis is doing here, he's gonna give us two notions of power to which he will contrast his notion of potentiality. So Lewis is giving us two notions of power, and then he's going to go on from that and say, well, actually, my notion of potentiality is different to these two notions of power. So I'm sure that's the kind of thing you do in your own dissertations. You set up two positions and you say, well, actually, I'm doing something different. I'm offering an alternative. So constitutive, constitutive, constitutive power, I'm taking this from um, uh, Lewis's book. Here it is, Inoperative Learning, um, up here on the, on the screen, Inoperative Learning. And Lewis writes, attempts to improve the operativity of the actual through better administration and management. 
That's what constitutive power is. You're trying to improve the operativity. Um, how might we paraphrase that word? Productivity, uh, functionality, the operativity, the way in which the actual works is made to work, the conditions upon which the actual uh, depends. Attempts to improve the operativity of the actual through better administration and management. Which is how constitutive power works. It's all about administration. It's all about management. Broadly speaking, it's technocratic. You are upholding the way in which things are done. Here, the goal is to make policy, pedagogy, and schools work or work better. It's all about putting things to work, maybe improving the way in which things work. Um, the faith here is that the, the operativity, the ability to work of the policy, pedagogy, and schools can be improved. And the assumption here is that the actual existing system of education is sound and justified. All you need to do is improve your administrative power to properly manage its, implement, its implementation. And that's the claim here. So on this account, everything is fine in the current system. All we need to do is to make sure the system works properly. It's all about making something work, making something operate, making something um, uh, tie together ends and means. So it operates, it functions, it goes along, the machine works, you get the idea. Accepting what is as what ought to be, constituted power works within the defined parameters of the actual to govern the distribution of resources, actions, practices, and accounts that make learning operative. So what do we have here? We have the idea of implementation is crucial and that constituted power is about how things are at the moment. Things are okay at the moment. We have to accept what is as what ought to be. The way in which things are is what they ought to be in the future. Therefore, the problem is simply to manage the system correctly such that it can function, such that it can work, such that it can operate. That's the word being used here continually, operating. So how can the system operate better? How can the distribution of resources, actions, practices, and accounts make this system function? And the word being used here is learning. Learning is something bad in weak philosophy of education. Learning, making learning operative is something which we, in weak philosophy of education, we don't want. And we, we, I'll explain that in a moment. So that's the idea. That's constitutive power, the way in which things are. To be contrasted with constituent power or revolutionary power. This is an idea we find in many Italian philosophers, not just uh, Giorgio Agamben, but also Antonio Negri, others, uh, plenty of Italian philosophers, thinking in terms of constituent power or revolutionary power. Now we're thinking here, certainly in terms of Tyson Lewis's presentation of this idea. And again, I'm quoting from Lewis here, attempts to critique the actual with the aim of producing new forms of operativity by articulating new norms, practices, and procedures. That's the idea. Revolutionary power is overturning the system, overturning the current system, overturning the system of power um, of the previous form of power that we mentioned. So the idea, idea is to produce new forms of operativity, to articulate new norms, new practices, new procedures, new ways of doing things. Here, the assumption is precisely the opposite of constituted power. What is must be negated in the name of the ought, which can become the actual through a complete destruction of the existing system. That's the idea here. You negate the is in the name of the ought. You negate being in the name of value, some particular value the ought. And the ought can become actual only if you destroy the existing system, only through destruction. Those of you who did my, who did my course over the summer in August, uh, the course on creative writing in the end times, will recall this manner of thinking, apocalyptic thinking, where the idea is only if you destroy can you create. Through apocalypse comes in rebirth, the new heavens and earth. We find the same logic in revolutionary thinking as well. This is what we call constituent power, where you destroy what is in, in the aim of creating something as it should be, as it ought to be. And this ought, ought to be, can only become actual through a complete destruction of the existing system. Critical and revolutionary denunciations of the total system project a profound faith that what is to come will offer the fulfillment that is continually deferred by the present state of education exception. It's the idea that, that um, 
constituent power, revolutionary power, depends on faith. And the faith is, if we destroy the system as it stands, if we denounce the entirety of the system, the total system, then something of importance may happen. And notice the expression here, the present state of educational exception. And I won't go into this in any detail, but the idea is that our state of, the, the way in which we live is we're governed through um, extraordinary laws, laws that only take place through a continual state of emergency or exception, where the normal authorities are being, have, been, have been suspended. Anyway. That's, another, that's a whole topic, big, big topic to talk about, so we'll put that aside. So that's the idea. That what's, what's the, the issue here is a total system, and the way it hangs together means that no, no part of it can be salvaged. It must be destroyed. And that's the apocalyptic faith we find in revolutionary projects. We also find it in um, many forms of uh, millenarianism, uh, Christianity, um, Judaism, Islam, all these uh, religions of the book draw notions of apocalypse in very interesting ways. But there's something else other than these alternatives. And that is, oh my, what's happened to my third slide? There it is, constituent potential. And constituent potential should be understood very differently from the previous two. The previous two uh, forms of education, um, so, sorry, forms of power, have at their heart an unquestioned relation between means and ends. For, for constitutive power, it's a question of just trying to reform the system that currently exists in order to harmonize means and ends. The means are good. The way the, what we want to achieve is a good thing. All we have to do is make sure those means are translated into proper ends. For revolutionary um, forms of power, what's important rather is that we destroy the current corrupted system of means so that noble and proper ends can be served. Well, in terms of philosophy of education, what this is about is strength. Philosophy of education is, is, must be made strong and exhibit its strength through its utilization to either repair or revolutionize education. So there you go. The idea is strength, the will, power. These are forms of power. Only by being powerful can educational philosophy remain element, relevant. Only by driving through the reforms of administration, only by trans, um, transforming the whole system, only then can educational philosophy um, do what's right, do what's just. It's all about power. Now, the third alternative here is not about power. It's about something else. Constituent potential breaks the link between the philosophy of education and constituting and constituent forms of power. This is again taken from Ty um, Tyson E. Lewis. Let's the firm bond between means and ends idle. So no, it's no longer about the relationship between means and ends being accomplished, it's being operative. It's no longer about proceeding from means to ends. The bond between means and ends that I've been talking about today, for example, um, yeah, there's a certain version of this in the relationship between aims and objectives or aims and intentions. This bond is going to be made to idle. It's going to be made not to do any work. It's going to be made to lie fallow. It's pretty amazing as a claim. And then openly letting philosophy of education be irrelevant, useless and irresponsible. And here Tyson E. Lewis is being polemical. He's saying, embrace your relevance, embrace uselessness, embrace irresponsibility. This is no longer about making a claim for the relevance of these ideas of constituent potential for the reform or the revolution of education. It's no longer about coming up with useful ideas understood within the parameters of strong philosophy of education. It's no longer about trying to inculcate le um, learners, uh, uh, to inculcate responsibility into learners. Now here we have the result is not a strong philosophy of education, but a radically weak one. A weak philosophy of education, which is not about trying to achieve ends through means. It's not about 
offering sage advice or ingenious solutions or political orientations or logical securities. And again, some more polemics here, which is supposed to be provocative. A weak philosophy of education would be stupid rather than wise, ignorant rather than genius, disoriented rather than oriented, insecure rather than secure. So imagine that, valuing stupidity, ignorance, disorientation and insecurity. It would open up a space and time for practices that do not have intentionally directed goals. This is not about goals that are directed towards a particular purpose. Now these practices would be precarious. They're not safe. They might not be even identifiable as education, like educational, Within the dominant logic of learning. You see here again, learning is um, a bogeyman for, um, for weak philosophy of education. The learning is itself a governed by a logic, according to these um, thinkers. They're doing this polemically. They're saying learning is something dominated by a particular logic, a logic of power, a, lo a logic that works through operation, operativity. And the idea here instead of activating something, a weak philosophy of education deactivates. It's not about activation. It's not about achievement. It's about deactivating. It's about in achievement. Now, we normally understand the D of deactivate privatively. We normally understand it to be, to be something negative, perhaps as doing nothing. But as Lewis writes, such deactivation does not mean doing nothing. It means returning to the potentiality underlying the possibility of new uses. So it's quite dense. What's it mean here? But returning to the potentiality. Now, earlier we were talking a little bit about the exciting exploratory stage during a PhD, which was Kirsten's expression. We're using that to characterize um, your first year of your PhD and by analogy, the opening weeks of your MA dissertation. At this moment, you're not exactly sure what's going to happen with your work. As Kirsten was saying, you know, there's obviously things that are going to change and grow. They're going to change and grow here. You know, ultimately, as you work, that sense of potentiality, of open potentiality, is something which is narrowed down, as it has to be. Because otherwise, how are you going to generate a, a, a project of study that is determinable, that has limits, that is feasible, that has contours? that has a direction in which it's going. So as we move from those early exciting stages of study, of writing, of academic writing, to later stages, what we often lose is that openness of potentiality. And maybe we'll say to ourselves, well, unfortunately, that's that. How can it be otherwise? You move from the indeterminate to the determinate. You move from something without any particular limits or contours, something which has limits and contours. Isn't that how it has to be? Well, not quite, not according to these thinkers. Weak philosophy of education suspends the time of progress and development, learning, by dwelling in the paradoxical in-between time of no longer, not yet. Again, these are quite dense formulations. Learning, once again, is linked to a logic. That logic here, uh, we should understand is the logic of development of going from A to B to C to D in a logical progression. There's progress here, there's development, there's something opening up. But what's interesting here about philosophy of weak philosophy of education is it dwells in the in-between time of no longer and not yet. Of something which is past, sorry, something in between what is past and what is, what, what is to happen in the future. This is kind of interesting. Whereas learning always attempts to overcome not yet, through the process of actualization in the form of winning the match, graduating, passing the test, actualizing one's talents and so forth, weak philosophy on the edu of education suspends this momentum by remaining within the uncomfortable position between no longer and not yet. So what's going on here? The expression we normally use with respect to potential is we actualize potential. If you're a school teacher, 
one of the things you might want to do is to say, I want every pupil in this class to realize their full potential, to actualize their full potential. I want everyone in this class to do the best they possibly can. And this is an ambition that we normally praise. A teacher who is bent upon having every um, student in their class do well, actualize their potentiality, we regard as someone who's diligent, who has proper ambition, who is a helpful, enabling um, learning coach. In a weak philosophy of education, something different is at stake. Something different here is an issue. It's not about actualizing. It's not about actualization. Rather, there's, there's a question of trying to maintain potentiality. Let me just step back from Tyson E. Lewis and talk, talk in general terms. I always love the beginnings of films. I always love it when the, um, films open, you're setting up the characters, the plot hasn't really yet started going, you're introduced to a location, you're shown all these things that can unfold in different ways. But you know, as the film, as films go on, I always get kind of bored as they move towards the climax. I love that sense of contingency, of openness. And what I don't like is a closing down, a, deter a, a, a determination, um, a, a, a strong plot sequence following, um, leading to a outcome. What I enjoy in films, but also in books as well, is the opening, the sense of limitless possibility. This can go anywhere you like, this story. Anything can happen. And that's the idea of staying with potentiality, of holding on to potentiality, of holding on to the excitement of the beginning. Now, what happens when you actualize something is you lose that sense of the um, of open potentiality. It becomes the no longer, it becomes the past. That's the idea. You lose that sense of potentiality, it becomes the past. You've got to move on, you've got to determine your project, you've got to give it a limit, you've got to make it feasible. You have to reassure your supervisor or the people who monitor your progress on your PhD. You have to reassure them that you are working according to plan, that you have a plan, that you have a research question that's orientating your work. Now, learning on this account, I'm reading again from Lewis, that learning destroys the not yet of a project. In order to fully actualize a latent potentiality for the student as productive learner, i.e. transform the not yet into the necessity of the must be of the professional scholar. And earlier with this phrase, I think it was Jess who used this phrase, um, junior scholar. And the idea as a junior scholar, you know, you have to learn to be realistic about your projects. You have to translate the not yet into the must be of the, of the professional scholar. You know, you have to learn how to um, accept the rules and, and the, the, the conventions uh, through which academic writing is produced. And once you've done that, perhaps you can be a bit more experimental, but first of all, you've got to learn that. But the idea here is, is strong words, you know, learning destroys the not yet of a project. Learning linked to development, linked to progress, progress and development, and an emphasis on these destroys the not yet, an open potentiality, that's the idea. It destroys these things in order to allow the student to be a productive learner. So we can see here that productivity is itself in question. Productivity, operativity, work, these things here are being called into question by weak philosophy of education. So to fulfill potentiality is to destroy it in the name of efficiency and effectiveness. Commanding and controlling the possibility offered by potentiality according to a sovereign logic, the logic of biocapitalism. So biocapitalism, that form of capitalism that's governed by, uh, sorry, that form of capitalism which, which governs life. A logic of biocapitalism, this is the claim being made, you know, we get this idea of development and progress as part of this, of learning as part of this. Something's being destroyed through the fulfillment of potentiality. Is being destroyed in the name of efficiency and effectiveness. What the system wants, what biocapitalism wants, is efficiency, effectiveness, operativity, productivity, the commanding and controlling of possibility. Command and control. 
let's go on. The contingencies of potentiality are what must be sacrificed in order for the student to learn X skills for X purposes, predetermined in advance by experts in the field of educational research and economic development. So, you know, this is the idea here, experts in the field of educational research, perhaps I would counter such an expert. And I'm predetermining how we should learn X skills and X purposes when it comes to today's session. I'm doing this in order to and help you get ahead in academia. And what I'm doing in, in, in talking in this way is sacrificing potentiality. I'm sacrificing your potentiality. I'm sacrificing the contingencies of your potentiality, the different directions in which your work, in which your life might go. And what I'm saying in effect is what anyone says is a position of authority within a given institution. What I'm saying is this is the reality principle. This is real politic. This is how things get done. If you want to get that funding, if you want to get um, if you want to get that PhD scholarship, if you want to get a job in academia, then these are the things you have to do. And in so doing, perhaps what I'm doing is something very similar to what Kirsten was talking about when she mentioned the idea of the art market. Remember this idea of the art market being null. And as I understand it, I think it's the work of Schoon. She had this idea of quantum scholars, uh, quantum, uh, quantum artists who acknowledge but ignore the art market. What have we thought of quantum scholars who acknowledge but ignore the whole logic of learning as it's been outlined so far in this part of today's workshop? The quantum scholar for whom academia at present is null in some way. It's an interesting idea. Let's just think about this as an idea and see where it takes us. Okay, so what happens in our learning system? What happens in our system of lifelong learning? I'm sure you heard that expression, lifelong learning. We learn all our lives, all our lives about learning new skills, about being flexible, fitting into the labor market. The result is the notion of the human as capable of only a select few behaviors, skills and actions easily assignable to a specific function within the overall division of labor. And that's the idea here, that learning, according to these thinkers, is tied to just those behaviors, skills, and actions that can allow you to get ahead in today's biocapitalism, in today's economic system, in today's society, I suppose. In other words, the logic of learning is anchored <clears throat> to an ontology of generic potentiality, as a not yet that must be, made manifest in measurably determinable, socially useful and economically manageable skill sets. That's the idea, the logic of learning is anchored to an ontology. An ontology simply means a theory of being, a theory of the way in which things are. There's a theory of the way in which things are, which understands those things in terms of potentiality that can be actualized. But here in weak philosophy of education, we find a different ontology, an ontology that's not interested in this idea of logic, development, progress. It's, at issue here is something different. It's not a question of turning the not yet into the must be. This idea of must be. So many times I've given advice to students in my office and said, well, if you want to get ahead in academia, if you want to get that job, if you want to get that, that funding, you have to do these things. Okay, it might seem like box ticking, but you have to do them. That's reality. The must be. What's being questioned here is the idea of the must be. Now, this questioning here is not about a total rejection of the system. It's about adopting a different relationship to the system. Perhaps this is something which Schoon would talk about in her work, when, when she explains quantum art. Certainly when I heard um, Kirsten talking about this, the expression was used, acknowledges, but ignores the art market. Acknowledges, but ignores. So you acknowledge the realities of the academic system, but in a certain sense, you place them in suspension. Learning in short concerns deadlines or lines that end with a death of potentiality. Here's a real nice play on words. The idea of a deadline, that which kills potentiality, which merely actualizes it. 
So the idea then is that there's a different relationship to potentiality, one which is not simply about actualizing potentiality, but doing something else with it. Well, you don't kill it, you let it live. To fulfill potentiality is to destroy it in the name of, oh, we had that already, didn't we? Sorry. My, my slides keep going backwards and forwards. Now let's try and go forwards. This is very, um, uh, yes, yes, okay, good stuff. This is what we want. The learning and deductification. Rather than producing a subject within a meaningful world of actions, apparatus of learning result in a special kind of de-subjectification. Deductification, the word subject can be used to refer to the human being. Deceptification means losing oneself as a subject. At first, this may seem paradoxical. The discourses and practice, practices of learning seem to emphasize self-motivation, self-directed action, and self-management. You know, that's what we talked about in terms of our aims and objectives. It's what I want to do, what I want to achieve, what I want to um, realize as a learning outcome. It's all about the I, 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 I. And this goes back to the point made up early, made earlier about academia. It's all about um, the I. It's all about the first person. We can't express collectively based ideas in any simple way. So um, acad academic language, the English language, is all about um, subject, uh, subject and object, cause and, cause and effect, about the individual. And likewise, academic structures themselves in which we articulate what we're going to do with a given project is all about the first person, about what I want. But the paradoxical claim that Lewis is making here is in fact, although it's this, this language is all about the self, it actually leads to a de-subjectification. Yet the emphasis on the self within the learning society speaks to an underlying crisis in the very self that is constantly being commanded to self-actualize is latent potentiality. So what's going on here? Well, the emphasis on the self indicates a crisis about the self. It's being commanded, it's being told, it's, um, it's being told it has to self-actualize, it's latent potentiality. You have to be what you could be. Who's telling us this? Biocapitalism, society in general, our economic system, our institutions in which we find ourselves. We have to actualize our latent potentiality. It's a duty. We're told it's even good for us. We have to get it all out into the open, bring it all out, work with the people we are, but on whose terms? On the system's terms, on biocapitalism's terms, on the institution's terms. The detectification is a process that insists on the world as it is, it has necessity, and that alternatives cannot possibly occur. Impossibility. So this form of um, this, this logic of learning, this logic of not just learning, but of living, I suppose, is a process that insists on the world as it is, as it is and as it must be, necessity. It can't be otherwise. And that alternatives cannot possibly occur. Impossibility. It can only be this way. The subject is captured as a resource for the world. His or her choices become nothing other than reflexes of the needs of the world to replicate itself. This world just goes on and on as it is. This world exists as a circle turning upon itself. Things may seem to change, but actually the un underlying logic is exactly the same. It's all about actualizing potentiality in the name of efficiency, in the name of progress, in the name of learning. This is our learning society. This is our lifelong learning society. And this, according to Tyson E. Lewis, is de-subjectivizing us. What an interesting claim, a surprising claim. Let's learn more about this. An issue here is a self-initiated entrepreneurialism. The university students should accommodate themselves to the forces of the market rather than produce a useless degree in the humanities. You might have heard this stuff from, I don't know, from, from people around you, I hope not, but maybe you have heard this idea that humanities are all useless, they're leading nowhere, you have to accommodate yourself to the world, adjust your ambitions to the reality principle, and learn how things really work. These theories of entrepreneurialism, uh, this optimism, 
and the capacity to self-realize, self-generated self and self-manage our potential, so as to manifest it in the form of an economically viable commodity, human capital. And you might you probably heard this expression, human capital. You realize yourself as stock, as something which has um, a value in the economy insofar as you can do things that are useful. Human capital, you, you know, different from a resource, you know, different from a river from which we want to extract hydroelectric power. You know, no different from coal or oil or farmland or the soil. You are simply that out of which some sort of value can be derived. Self-realizing, self-generating, self-managing, all these, all these ideas that we have these days are um, modeled on the notion of the entrepreneur, the person who sells themselves as human capital. Now, this is an optimism. Um, these, 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 according to Tyson E. Lewis, are disempowering. They deny the very real freedom of impotentiality, a capacity to be otherwise, to think otherwise, to live otherwise. You might say to yourself, well, doesn't this sound rather like revolutionary power? So what we should do, instead of just putting up with necessity, the way in which the world has to be, putting up with the impossibility of, of other alternatives, what, what we should do is simply destroy the system, explode it. What we need is apocalypse. And again, I'm thinking of the stuff I was teaching over the summer, the idea of um, destroying the world as it currently exists, of the power of negation. Well, what's interesting about this notion of education that Tyson E. Lewis and friends have come up with is it is not about negation. It's not about revolution at all. It's about establishing a new relationship, a new kind of relationship with power, with institutions. It's not about destroying them. It's not about the revolution. It's not about um, a new way of uh, linking up means and ends. It's about something different. And an issue here is what's called impotentiality. Not potentiality, but impotentiality. And this refers to potentiality that is unrealized, unactualized, and to which we want to hold on to insofar as it constitutes what is called here real freedom, that big philosophical word freedom. We want to hold on to our freedom somehow. And this freedom is, is precisely our not actualizing ourselves according to the logic of learning. So now I think things are hopefully becoming clear to you. What's the issue here? George Agamben, today's man believes himself capable of everything. So he repeats this jovial, no problem, and his irresponsible, I can do it, precisely when he should instead realize that he has been consigned in unheard of measures to forces and processes over which he has lost all control. He has become blind, not, not to his capacities, but to his incapacities, not to what we can do, but to what he cannot or can not do. Quite dense. We as human beings, the Gabon always uses the he form. Um, we believe ourselves to be capable of everything. We can do anything. We repeat, no problem. I can do it when we're asked to do things. Well, instead, what we should do is realize that in fact, we are subordinated by all kinds of powerful forces and processes over which we have lost control. If we simply say, yes, I can do it, Yes, no problem. We lose not our capacities, but our incapacities, our impotential, that which is not realizable in the system of efficiency, the logic of learning. So what we lose is what we cannot or can not do within the current system. I thought in order to make this clearer, we move to another thinker, just briefly, and his name is um, Byung Chun Han. So Byung Chun Han's with a whole bunch of these very short books, um, really nice, very readable books, uh, with very short sentences, incredibly readable. Um, Byung Chun Han from South Korea writes in German. So his German is, um, you know, he writes in very, very nice, short, clear sentences. And um, the whole, at least 10, 12 books, they're very, very readable. I recommend uh, dipping into these books, full of interesting insights. We look very, very briefly at a couple of things from um, the first book which came out of his in English, The Burnout Society. Now, what Byung-Chul Han does here is set up a contrast. 
And the contrast is between today's society and that form of society we find diagnosed in the work of Michel Foucault. Foucault is a very famous thinker, and you may have heard of his thoughts. Um, you may be studying his thought, but you know, if you're not doing a, a philosophy or a related discipline, you might not know his work well. Foucault writes about what he calls the disciplinary world, the world of discipline. It's a world that characterized, characterizes hospitals, madhouses, prisons, barracks, factories, until, until recently, until say 40 or 50 years ago. And indeed, some um, organizations still are still run on, on disciplinary terms. So these, um, this, what, what disciplinary, disciplinary means will, will emerge as we, as we, as we continue, continue to discuss this idea. These, uh, this system has been replaced by another regime, a society of fitness studios, office towers, banks, airports, shopping malls, and genetic laboratories. 21st century society is no longer a disciplinary society, but rather an achievement society. So it's not about discipline. It's not about saying, no, you can't do that. You have to do this. Stay, stay within these, um, these, um, these rules, uh, stay within them. These inhabitants are not, no longer obedient subjects, but achievement subjects. It's not about obeying, it's about achieving. This is a broad characterization of the last few decades. And you know, look, look at Bjorn Chilhan, he's the same expression here. Uh, we are entrepreneurs of ourselves. Now, disciplinary society, we find a society of negativity. It is defined by the negativity of prohibition. You must not do this, you must not do that. The negative modal verb that governs it is may not. You may not do this, you may not do that. By the same token, the negativity of compulsion adheres to should. Achievement society, more and more, is in the process of discarding negativity. It's not about saying you're not allowed to do this, stop doing that. What we get instead is deregulation. We get unlimited can. The unlimited can is a positive modal verb of achievement society. Its plural form, the affirmation, yes, we can, epitomizes achievement society's positive orientation. Prohibitions, commandments, and the law are replaced by projects, initiatives, and motivation. Disciplinary society is still governed by no. Its negativity produces madmen and criminals. In contrast, Achievement society creates depressives and losers. So we're passing through a lot of material here quite quickly. But let me just try and summarize the key points here. Chulhan says we're moving from one world to another. The old world was a world governed by discipline, by clear rules, by certain forms of negativity. You say no, you get punished. You say yes, okay may not is the modal verb that governs this society. You may not walk on the grass. You may not talk to your colleagues at lunchtime. You know, you may not uh, arrive to work late. If you do these things, you'll be punished. There's compulsion here. You should behave in a certain way. But in our society, which Byung Chul Han calls achievement society, this notion of negativity has been discarded more or less, was being discarded as we speak. What we get instead is deregulation. So this notion of disciplinary society, many of us will see returning around us as we speak, but let's put that aside uh, for the moment. We'll stick with Byung Chul Han, just to be, just for clarity's sake. So yes, we can is what we now say to ourselves. Yes, I can do it. Yes, of course, I'll do that at once, immediately. And what's this is what we find governing fitness studios. I go to the fitness studio, yes, I'll give you 30 reps on a resistance machine. In the office towers, yes, I'll work late. You know, I'll make sure I have the contract drawn up in time. If you're working in banking and in law, you're, you're often working very long hours. In airports, yes, of course we'll do that. It's the yes, we can. Now, according to Byung Chul Han, negativity, the no, produces people who are regarded as mad, who can then be locked up in madhouses, they've been locked up as insane. You know, the claim being made here by Foucault, and, and, and Chulhan is paraphrasing Foucault here really, is that mad people are produced by a system, likewise criminals. They're criminals because we have prisons, because we have a legal structure, which says no to certain forms of behavior. We produce criminals. 
And Chulhan's um, provocative claim here is achievement society creates depressives and losers. So this is a really interesting claim. Remember earlier on I said to you, um, one thing which concerns me as someone who supervises PhD students and examines them and distributes money to, for, for scholarships, what concerns me is depression. It's something I see around me in, in students. Um, this is why I was quite struck by Chul Han's account. Now Chul, Chul Han draws on the work of a psychoanalyst called M. Ehrenberg. And Ehrenberg locates depression and transition from a disciplinary society to an achievement society, basically. That's Chul Han putting Ehrenberg's arguments in his Chul Han's terms. Here's the argument about depression. Depression began its ascent when the disciplinary model for behaviors, the rules of authority and of observance of taboos, that gave social classes as well as both sexes a specific destiny, broke against norms that invited us to undertake personal initiative by enjoining us to be ourselves. So the, the depression begins at the same moment where we begin to say, yes, we begin to say, yes, I can, modeling ourselves as entrepreneurs who take initiative to be ourselves, to be who we are, to be what we are. The depressed individual is unable to measure up. He is tired of having to become himself. For Ehrenberg, depression is the pathological expression of the late modern human being's failure to become himself. We can generalize this himself here. Human beings in our time are told, become who it is you are. That's almost a form of commandment. Come, become who it is you are, actualize your potential, find out who you are, make the best of it, plug yourself into the system, find a place where your particular talents and skills will be valued. Now, depression results when you fail to become who it is you are. We talked earlier about this idea of internalization. We internalize in ourselves, we internalize in our bodies, what we should be able to do. And you know what? We punish ourselves when we find ourselves unable to do these things. The form of that punishment is depression. I cannot do it. I fall short. I fall short not of what my boss demands of me, so much as what I demand of myself, so much as what I want from myself. I want to finish my PhD on time in three years. I want by the end of my first year to come up with a rock solid research question. I want by the end of my second year to have three chapters of my six chapters completely drafted. This is the idea of internalizing, taking on into your body these, um, uh, this, these aspirations. It seems to be optimistic. It seems to be uh, a wonderful way to make yourself work, to drive yourself on, to inspire yourself. But the claim that Ehrenberg makes, as paraphrased by Chul Han, it is precisely what leads us into depression. Depression erupts at the moment when the achievement subject is no longer able to be able. First and foremost, depression is creative fatigue and exhausted ability. You push yourself too hard. You've expected too much of yourself. The complaint of the depressive individual nothing is possible, can only occur in a society that thinks nothing is impossible. So you see the claim here. Nothing is impossible, generates a depressive position potentially, nothing is possible. No longer being able to fight to be able leads to destructive self-reproach and autoaggression. We turn on ourselves, we reproach ourselves, we do not forgive ourselves, we don't give ourselves a day off we think I should be working constantly. I see this all around me in postgraduate students. I don't see lazy students. I see students who demand of themselves so much that they fight with themselves. They struggle with themselves. As Byun Chul Han says, the achievement subject finds itself fighting with itself. The depressive has been wounded by internalized war. We are at war on ourselves. Depression is the sickness of a society that suffers from excessive positivity. It reflects a humanity waging war on itself. So that is Chul Han. 
So let me stop sharing for a moment. So I want you to include as part of today's workshop a lecture. And that was my lecture, which hopefully pulled together some of the things we were talking about in the first half of today's session, and perhaps pushes these things in other and provocative um, directions. Before we proceed any further, I wonder if there are any remarks, questions, or comments on what I've talked about. Anything which might need clarification? Anything which uh, might need, I don't know, uh, further explanation? There's no need to ask any questions if you have no questions. The general gist of things, I hope, is broadly clear. Okay, so in that case, we'll proceed a little bit further. And what I want to do is to set you an exercise. So exercise is what we always use in creative writing. And I always thought, if I'd known about these when I was teaching philosophy, I would certainly have had exercises when I, when I taught philosophy, because they're very useful as a way to, to have everyone together, together their thoughts together, and to interact with some of the material in lectures. Let me share this material with you. Okay. So, I want you to um, take an exercise for 10 minutes. And this is the exercise here is how might we, how might we engage weak philosophy of education in academic writing? So I want to think about this question before I set you off um, to try and do this question. If there is such a thing as weak philosophy of education, how might we interact with it? How might we come into contact with it? How might we bear witness to the, the, the experiences that it, it, it values, the idea of, of idling, the idea of this potentiality which is not actualized? How might we engage this um, in writing? What practices of writing might allow us to engage with this weak philosophy of education? I want you to think about this question, both within the terms of current academia and, without, and outside of academia, as we currently experience it. I want you to imagine what another form of education might be like, one which is no longer tied to lifelong learning as we find it characterized in weak philosophy of education. What might writing dissertation look like? So what I'm doing here is I'm going to draw on your, on your experiences and expertise and your engagement with lecture material in order to dream with you about another form of education, about what it might be like to think of another form of university. Okay, so 10 minutes, jot down some ideas. Okay, difficult task, but I hope it's one which has been stimulating. Anyone care to share? their thoughts on opening up academic writing. I can share a couple of thoughts. Great, please like. do, please do. Um, I'm not so sure, but this is just what came up um, when I was having a think. And I just wrote that uh, maybe a dissertation that involves exploring a subject through real life experiences and perhaps measuring through or working with gut instincts, emotion, um, lineage, maybe our own lived experiences within our communities. And I wrote sort of collective experimentation. So I guess that's where my mind took it. Mm, okay. So exploring subject through, through real life, um, I guess through our local, local area in some sense, is that right? So you think of a locality here? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. And I guess yeah. um, looking at things that maybe aren't necessarily, um, I guess, maybe valued in academic writing would be like something yeah. like a gut instinct, which is yeah. super, um, I think it's a pretty cool tool to tap into. And so mm. in a it world where that cool. was, yeah, I mean, that I would like to see, maybe I'd like to see that um, valued a bit more. It would be interesting to see. Um, how even this group of people right now, like what our instincts can um, can provide us with. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, but what, it's very interesting, this idea of um, working with something local in real life, something which arouses gut instincts, emotions, which might be about articulating a, a, something communal. I think here of a recent book published by a woman called Lisa McKenzie. She's an academic actually quite near here in Newcastle. She worked in Durham. 
and it's a it's an ethnography of a um, a council estate. So an estate which is provided by the government where people live and and, uh, and pay rent, but largely live on on welfare in this case. And um, it's the most wonderful ethnography. It's incredibly readable. It opens up a world I knew nothing about, a working class world, and it shows you forms of solidarity which we not we wouldn't normally um, um, witness. And the woman herself lived in this estate, lived in this council estate for many, many years. And what's interesting about her, she left academia after writing the book because her gut instinct said, you know, her gut instinct said, I've got to get out of this. I've got to, I've got to try and find new ways of um, thinking where I can join up with a local community. And that's what she actually ended up doing. So that, that's, what, that's what your suggestion um, reminds me of, um, Gabrielle. I don't know if that's if, is that sort of thing you're thinking of. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, that that was really interesting. I'm gonna look her. I'm gonna look her up. Look her up because that book, I forget what it's called, is is a revelation. It's really it's a new form of writing, and it's another project she's done since then, a lockdown project, which I haven't read. I bet that's really fascinating. Mm. Lisa McKenzie, as I said, she left academia because she felt this kind of work could not be done from the perspective of a university. You know, you, you have to uh, live in the world in a different way. And she herself had been part of that estate for 20 years. So it's, it's, a, it's a very passionately written work. And at the same time, it's very insightful. Um, it's, it's, I wouldn't call it coolly analytic, but it does have those elements of um, talking about, it uses statistics to describe the, the nature of uh, deprivation in that estate, but also talks about the way in which people thrive and live and enjoy life in that estate. I thought it was a really exciting piece of work. So interesting. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll definitely look her up and find out the uh, piece about lockdown. Yeah, great. Please do. Any other suggestions here? Oh, yes. Um, Megan, I have you here, us. Sorry, it's Nathan. Somehow Nathan. I got switched over to a different household member's Zoom. Um, yeah, mine kind of now seems repetitive to that discussion, but I had a little list of uh, ways of valuing the progress and process of the work, like what you have or what has happened in you in the four to however many years of exploring the area of interest, the ability to play in the process, uh, so you could mediate through the content or material in a variety of ways to see what and how notions are shareable and communicable. Like in my case, I was thinking that poetry, mathematics, all these different sort of languages and forms, architecture may convey the results of the inquiry better than uh, conventional forms of academic writing. Uh, creativity and exploration to value richer or more profound questions or even lostness as a result of the study and beauty of the expressiveness and representation of the exploration. So it would be all about developing different methods or modes of tracking progress that can include things like personal relations or inner tranquility or changing of mind and habit, uh, like what goes on in the activity of study, but I, still, yeah. but still expressing the content of what was investigated. Wonderful. Thanks, Nathan. That was, you actually added an awful lot there to our previous discussion. So this idea of, um, of, of charting our progress in a different sense, uh, the way in which we as researchers have, might have gained a certain tranquility, the way in which we might have changed our habits, the way in which we might have new interpersonal relations, new friendships, new um, New people we hang out with. Uh, that these are, are things to be very, very much valued. These are not just um, extraneous things to the process of research. And I wonder about documenting these. Um, in creative writing, what we do, we get students to keep a creative journal. And uh, the creative journal feeds into an assessment they always do alongside their creative work. They have to produce a self reflective essay. But what they do is chart the way in which they've changed, their work's changed, what they've learnt. The point is that this is part of the um, production of an essay or dissertation. Part of it is that, and they're assessed on it. And the idea is that we, we can assess them on 
um, how well they're able to express that self-reflective process. And you try and include within that, that the process of, of your work, um, how you've changed, what you've become. Now, it, this idea of an achievement society in Byung-Chul Han, or the learning society, it's all about efficiency and productivity. And as what you're, what you're saying here is, there are things that um, can't be captured in these terms, which might be more akin to play. And she said, play is an interesting idea here. So what's involved is a playing with ideas, in a broad sense with life, with your own life, something is at play. An activity of learning does not have to be serious with a capital S. There are things which can happen as a result of you working in research, playful things, fun things. Again, I think of Lisa McKenzie, as part of her research into what men got up to in that council estate, I think it was in Nottingham, she joined a boxing gym and she learned to box because that's where men were to be found in the gym and she wanted the men to trust her. She lived in the estate for 20 years. If I remember rightly, what she says is she'd largely interacted with women. She wanted to know where the men went and what the men did. She learned boxing. And so she was in the gym every day and they gradually took her seriously and began to talk with her and share their lives with her. And that's an example of play, some sort of playful interaction with the environment that you're researching, particularly if it's a local environment in some way. The idea of lostness, the lostness itself could be an outcome. I think of all those wonderful dialogues of Plato, the early dialogues, which they, they end up with everyone just being totally confused. You know, Socrates at the end of these early dialogues of Plato just says, you know, I've no idea, I've no idea. I mean, we're in a state of aporia, uh, befuddlement, literally not being able to proceed any further. So that can be a, a result, the idea of lostness being valuable. So rather than confusion being something you want to eliminate in your research, you hold on to the idea that lostness is actually quite important, disorientation is actually something which is to be prized because it means you're not following conventional signposting. So, you know, you're off the beaten track. Um, this is his positive. It's what Heidegger calls the um, Holzweger, forest paths that lead nowhere, forest paths cleared by foresters that just begin in the woods and then stop in the woods. You know, you're, you're, you're nowhere in particular. You also and mentioned... In a way, they, oh. ahead, in a yeah. way they in increase possibility, right? Like that would be yeah. a great outcome of a dissertation is that the possibilities expanded rather than narrowed. Absolutely. So you increase possibility rather than actualizing potentiality. You increase the, the, the possibilities which are there in potentiality. You open them out still wider. So you have a million different directions in which you can go. And your, your work, your dissertation remains, somehow it remains within that space of, of sheer potential and openness. The garden of forking paths. Uh, what else did you mention here? The beauty of, of expressiveness the way in which you express your research findings can be beautiful in some way, enticing, entrancing. Perhaps you could realize it in a form which is not necessarily that of writing, but of mathematics, of architecture you mentioned. There are other ways in which you can share or communicate your work with others. So that you can, the results of your inquiry can be conveyed differently in a way in which people can, people can engage with this stuff and you can begin conversations, new interactions. So there's so much here and stuff you mentioned, Nathan, there's so much, um, so much richness, so many interesting things, so interesting paths that can be taken. So thanks very much for all those thoughts. Let me turn again to um, Genghis. Yeah. Um, do you hear me? So yeah, can you hear me? Okay, mm -hmm. sorry, because my connection some some at some point dropped. Anyway, um, you touched uh, the, the last point was uh, I, I take it from there again um, because I thought about that and it, for me uh, the essence is cooperation um, and, and, and and let's call it political actually uh, solidarity um, uh, among like researchers um, well first critically assessing the situation means that we see uh, uh, we are very uh, atomized um, uh, self-centered um, thinking not con not being um, conversation is part of the game but it's not um, a very institutionalized frequent thing um, and it's mostly presenting oneself 
um, mm, and well, the the pressure we we experience is uh, was well presented already. Uh, but the point of it is also that we 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 feel very alone with it. Um, we. we 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 feel singularized um, um, and and some somehow um, I think cooperate cooperation needs to be institutionalized in a way um, that we can um, support each other um, uh, and there are so many barriers one barrier is for instance ah you, you well a PhD needs to be written uh, on your own, of course. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, they're your own thoughts, but thoughts are always like um, infected by each other. So, in in some way, um, and um, and it's also like the procedure of write, writing. Um, I mean, I feel like when when I meet with a friend in a library, and I write like five to eight hours, um, and I go home afterwards, or um, I, I do something with a friend, go for a drink or something. I've, I, I don't have the pre afterwards that I don't, don't feel the pressure to, to continue my work because I feel like I, 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 I feel valued by, uh, by uh, sitting uh, beside each other and, and, and maybe uh, talking about what in the breaks, talking about what happened. And I think that that is something very simplistic actually, but we have, we unlearned already. Um, because one can one can one can coin it uh, achievement society when one can coin it in a more broader sense neoliberal um, 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 society whatever but this 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 very very um, 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 self centered um, way of doing things not cooperating not not asking for help and actually the other way around also not offering help. Like when I when I talked to my parents when they when they when they studied, it was pretty normal to to um, exchange like protocols um, 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 and and uh, um, um, uh, handwritings and all this stuff and and, and uh, students uh, did scripts of lectures and and, and uh, gave it to others that they can do uh, that they can achieve better in in in. Um, in, in, in exams and, and now today I feel like it's it's very much when you uh, the case that that you even have some some even ask you to pay for a, a protocol already in, in, in some universe and I think that's to unlearn this would be uh, that would be more actually that would help ex uh, academic success as well and as much as well-being thank you that's very moving reflections the idea of unlearning, atomization. You say here, uh, we, we try to recover some sense of political solidarity, practices of friendship, practices of working together, of exchanging work, um, overturning atomized, self-centered, self-centered focus. Yeah, we, we write our PhDs ourselves, we write our dissertations ourselves, but there's a way of um, sharing what we are as researchers with, with other people. And this could be simple thing as you say going for a drink after five to eight hours in the, in the, in the library which is a very long amount of time spent writing so going for a drink just to be with other people who've done something similar and as you say normally in institutions students um doing postgraduate work graduate students present papers to one, to one another of their own work and that's how they interact um there might be a different way to think of of institutionalizing cooperation to so some kind of cooperation. Now here at Newcastle, we also have these things like postgraduate get togethers and then no one ever goes to them. So it's really hard to, to, to find a way, to find a social form that people will enjoy. I'm not sure what it would be, but we, we're always thinking about this. What people do come to is the opportunity to present their work to other students. But I think what you're saying here is, is this unlearning is not easy. It's not easy. Your parent generation you know, has a very different relationship to each other, to academia, to the world. So unlearning is not something we can simply do by saying, right, let's all meet at eight o'clock um, after your studies that day. We'll meet at eight o'clock in the evening and we'll socialise. It's not going to be that easy. So active unlearning, recapturing solidarity um, in which we can allow thoughts to circulate, to infect one another. This should be as you say, which is productive even in, in, in academic terms, this is, is productive, you know. Um, and this idea of, of cooperation above all, so inventing new forms of cooperation. It's interesting, 
in, in contemporary academia, you know, when you trained postgraduates, you say that, what about having an accountability buddy? Someone who you are paired with and you compare notes on where you are in your thesis. But what you're saying is something much more than that. It's some sort of practice of friendship and the question of reinventing solidarity, friendship, community, cooperation. Yeah, this, this sounds um, very valuable. So thanks, thanks very much for those reflections. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one, one, one essence of it is, um, I mean, in, in especially liberal or, or, or radical or critical um, <laughs> thinking, um, we tend to, we, we, we all feel like comrades in, in, in thought, but uh, in practice we aren't. Um, we behave very much like uh, um, um, uh, 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 like everybody else, and I, I think that that we need to change that as well. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, when, I, when I used to be in philosophy, no one no one really read each other's work, and uh, occasionally people would send me their work, and you never really get around to reading it. You know, you just do your own thing because you need to get your career going or you need to get a promotion, whatever it is. Um, very very little. But people just don't read one another, um, and that, that's that's an, an, an feeling. Well, people, colleagues don't even read each other's work. I work in creative writing now; it's entirely different. Everyone reads each other's work in creative writing. Uh, it's a very different um, space, and this is something which could be learned in other disciplines. Uh, there could be ways in which you share your work in some way. So, thanks, thanks very much again for your reflections, uh, Mehdi. Have I pronounced your name correctly? That's that's actually very good. Thank okay. you very much for a very insightful. Uh, talk and just pushing on, on what Nathan brought up to the discussion. Um, one way of, um, and this might be a little bit more nuanced and more focused to some disciplines more than others, but um, the, the idea of um, uh, design as a methodology that can supplement um, ac academic writing, like you can, you can still think, I, and it, it, you can, you can be a dancer, you can be a you can be uh, an architect in my case i'm more familiar with that uh, body of knowledge and i usually use those examples but imagine you even if you're working on on on, on, <clears throat> on like for example at the idea of event in heidegger what happens if you design a house with that idea and how 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 how, how that would supplement your research to a certain extent i think what what that brings to the table is uh, is is the fact that there is a, an element of uncertainty and at the same time a, a process that can lead you to an outcome quicker than um, may may lead to an outcome quicker than 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 lots of um, lots of other sorts of uh, ex exploration. That's in my part my personal case that that is significantly helpful because it it brings it it brings me back to the game that I'm a little bit more familiar with and 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 utilize the skills that I developed over years. Okay, this idea of design, design as a method. So some sort of idea of design, taking your work out from one subject area to another. You move from Heidegger, the notion of event in Heidegger. What would what, what would it be like to design a house with that in mind? This is a very interesting idea. It's a very interesting model. Um, you imagine having a conference, some sort of student conference, where people are asked to translate their ideas into a different subject area or to, to, to some process of design. It's a very interesting thought as to how this might occur. And there are models, you know, Derrida worked with that architect, didn't he? I can't remember his name now. Um, so there's very interesting, very interesting ways to think cross-disciplinary um, relationships here. That would bring things to life, I think, wonderfully. Um, dancing, movement, physical movement, and to work with uncertainty in some sense, and to have unexpected outcomes, outcomes that we didn't think were going to occur. Yeah, they're unpredictable. So these could be certainly built into an academic program of some sort. I always think of um, now working creative writing, of building in some sort of cre creative endeavor, whatever it is, into a PhD, into a dissertation, or into an MA dissertation. Um, and you can have an appendix in, in, in the dissertation to explain the significance of that particular thing. But I think your content is broader. What you're saying is cross disciplines. I think that's that's a more exciting prospect, actually, and it could lead to interesting collaborations across disciplines. So I think what, what you're suggesting there is very, very practical as very uh, as well as you know, inspiring and, and, and uh, you know, open skies, whatever the expression we want to use here. So I think this is very useful. 
Thank you very much. Carl, what were your thoughts? Ah, yes. Um, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Okay, great. Great. Excellent. Yes. Um, so first, I'd like to say it was a, a wonderful um, lecture. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Um, and a lot of food for thought, absolutely. Um, so in response to the question, uh, I wanted to bring attention to um, a typographical um, tool that can be used, the ellipses, right? I really thought that could be a really simple gesture as it were, in terms of the rigorous um, academic uh, writing um, milieu, right? To, to use that. Um, in other words, um, to use ellipses to express uh, hesitation amidst, uh, amidst the rigor, you know, of uh, the, the academic exposition. Um, that was the one uh, novel idea I wanted to emphasize, but I can also, um, uh, say just a few more words, a few, if, if that'd be all right. Um, so to engage the weak uh, theory or the weak philosophy of education in academic writing um, within academia, um, I would say that it would be to utilize written notes, written literature reviews, um, written drafts, even personal journals or diaries, even spoken, um, informal academic uh, discussions. Um, so in, in the inclusion of those kind of gray literatures, as it were. Um, okay, now that's within. And that's in addition to the ellipses, right? Um, and now without academia, um, I would say to read and study uh, across disciplines, uh, aimlessly, as it were. Uh, and to be in a way against writing. Um, so no need to write, why write? I believe this was Socrates um, kind of uh, position. I believe somewhere he said, I don't remember where, but why write? You know, he was all about speech and just discussion and, and corrupting the youth in a good way, as it were, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and the ideal here would be just the application of, of the above in some way. So that um, would be it. So thank you very much for allowing me to uh, contribute. Cheers. Thanks, Carl. Um, yes, this is very interesting. Great literature. It's a great expression, great literature. Great literature. This stuff on the edges of, of um, our practice as academics, as, as writers, yeah, these drafts, these diaries, informal discussions, um, we can utilize written notes. We do this in creative writing. We, we have two modules now, undergraduate and postgraduate, where you submit your journals and you submit a commentary on the journals. But the journals are really, really important. And the students are encouraged to make these journals, to decorate them, to make them interesting looking with pictures with different media. So I think this, this, is, this is something which could be achieved really quite easily. The ellipses is very intriguing to build into a, um, a text which is ostensibly rigorous and so on, um, ellipses where you indicate something which might not be known. Tyson E. Lewis actually in his book on study has these chapters in italics where he writes in a sort of playful literary way um, rather than in a, in a, in a dissertation like manner. You know, he, he plays around these ideas in, in, these, in these little appendices attached to the chapters. Uh, ellipses within the sentences themselves. Um, I remember George Bataille's uh, has this wonderful book, Inner Experience, which is full of ellipses. And he has ellipses which last for not just three dots, you know, about 30 or 40 dots. He's the one who started all that. Jean-Luc Nancy gets it from Bataille. Uh, we have just dots trailing off all the time. And Bataille in his work will talk about, I'm exhausted. I can't go, I can't go on any further. You know, I'm tired of writing. And Nick Land, in his commentary on George Bataille, um, tried to radicalize uh, even Bataille's procedure in this sense. But it's inscribing into the piece of work your tiredness, weariness, your sense of disorientation, your sense that there might be more to things than you're letting on. So these, these are all very useful, interesting ideas. As sort of avant-garde writerly practice. Um, again, Nick Land, Nick Land, if you don't know his work, he was a, a philosopher in academia. Who left academia and began to write all kinds of wild things um, and very interesting to look at his work from a formal perspective. Um, he used fiction and other things to 
to convey his to convey his thoughts. Um, without academia, you mentioned the idea of studying across disciplines, and this is something that's come up a couple of times already. Very very useful exercise. I love this idea of being against writing. This is this is this is wonderful. Against writing, Socrates is someone who was in the marketplace. He would talk to anyone who would stop and talk to him, and he was not afraid of their position in society, and he would engage them in debate. And all Plato does in his dialogues is, is you know, apparently, you know, maybe it's not as straightforward as this, is recall some of these debates that Socrates had with people. The idea of debate, of living conversation, of talking to other people, as someone very introverted myself who stays in a lot, I find that frightening as an idea. Which means we have to be, you know, there has to be some some forum for this, something where we we, 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 we make it happen, and we encourage one another, no matter how introverted we are, to, to to make this to make this actually occur. So I think that that notion of Socrates is an interesting one. You raised in the chat a um, the point about achievement society radicalizing in some way. What we find in Nietzsche's thought is radical yay saying, and I want to reiterate the point I made in the chat, which is. Um, Tyson E. Lewis has a really, really thought-provoking discussion of this notion in one of those books he wrote. I think it might have been in, in Operative Learning, it's in that one. And he has the idea of becoming who you are. And he uses the expression to characterize the notion of the self we find in Nietzsche, but actually um, also in contemporary thinkers influenced by Nietzsche, like Gilles Deleuze. And when you read that chapter, uh, what Lewis argues is something that's been argued before, that these notions of the self combine very well with what whether we call it neoliberal capitalism. We, we, that, that's familiar. But Lewis fleshes this out in the next section, which is called Become Less Than You Are. And what he does there is drawing on a Gambon's work, as he does everywhere. He has, he, he, um, has another form of selfhood, where what you aspire to is not sending out relation, um, uh, sending yourself out in all these different directions but in some sense, becoming less than who it is you're supposed to be, uh, becoming anonymous, becoming no one in particular. Um, so this is what we find in, in, and this is beautifully done in Lewis. It's a really great discussion, very thought provoking for me. Um, it really makes me understand my reservations about Deleuze and, and Nietzsche, which are, as um, Gabrielle pointed out earlier, you know, this, this idea, a gut instinct, that my gut instinct is against these thinkers, in, you know, uh, even, if, even though I admire them, it's against these thinkers. So thank you for your thoughts. I want to just in closing now to talk a little bit about a particular literary writer who I think might be instructive in this regard. So let's just turn to the PowerPoint once again. I'm going to share some, some thoughts about the work of an author who Lewis also refers to, and that's uh, Robert Balser. Okay, so, so some thoughts in closing about a literary uh, writer whose work is sits, sits in a very interesting relationship to all this stuff. Uh, here we are. It's always nice to see a picture like this of an author you admire, a literary author. There's Robert Valser. Say about W.D. Say about a famous contemporary writer called Valser, a clairvoyant of the small. And Susan Bernofsky wrote a biography of, of Valser under the name of Clairvoyant of the small um, says that what what Valser does is spin tales around insignificance. Valser became best known really in his lifetime for the short form writings he began to produce once he lost his dreams of literary stardom, and these are just tiny little essays which go all over the place. Observations, thoughts, and insights are prompted by very simple things. For example, by looking at a picture. But Kafka was a great admirer of Valser, and the influence is very very strong. On Kafka's work. And Walter Benjamin wrote an essay about Valser, a fantastic essay as always by Benjamin. Ben, Valser is always too modest and quirky in his, in, his, in his writing to reach a wide audience. And his protagonists are usually children, social outcasts, artists, the impoverished, the marginalized, the forgotten. They typically speak in long, erudite sentences. And you can see his work as very much part of a return to a turn to naive and primitive work in the period in which he was, he was writing. The attempt to try and reach a lack of self-consciousness, direct simplicity, a pre-intellectual world. Uh, Kandinsky and Franz Marc are also uh, artists who are linked to this, 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 this um, practice, the deliberate cultivation of childishness in Dada. And there are examples also in Zarathustra, as I spoke Zarathustra by, by, by Nietzsche, uh, the notion of the child and the figure of the idiot in Dostoevsky. 
we find all these at play in Robert Valser's work. And in particular in this novel, which Tyson E. Lewis gives a reading of in, um, in Operative Learning. And it's one of my favorite books, actually, Jakob von Gunten. It's always been one of my favorite books. And it was, it was Robert Valser's favorite, favorite of his own books. It's the fourth novel he wrote. And it was a real flop. He got great reviews. Herman Hesse himself wrote a very, very uh, appreciative review of the book, but unfortunately it barely sold. And um, uh, Valser comments, the less the action, the smaller geographical region the writer uses, the more important is his talent. And immediately suspicious of novelists who excel in plot and use the whole world as their character. Everyday events are beautiful and rich enough that a writer can spot, um, write, spot, strike sparks from them. So it's about the everyday. And this, this novel is a parody of larger German bildungsromans like Goethe's Wilhelm Meister's uh, Wanderjahre, um, which emphasize personal development and self elevation through education. What Walter does is provide a surreal alternative. Education is not about self actualization so much as an ambiguous experience of suspension, interruption, and exhaustion without determinate end or positive outcomes. I'm quoting there from Tyson E. Lewis. So Jakob himself, and I seem to be missing a slide here uh, anyway, Jakob himself is the protagonist of the, of the novel, and he comes from a bourgeois background. He's trying to leave behind him. He tries to leave it behind him by entering this very peculiar institution called the Benjamenta Institution. It's a kind of school. There are six pupils in the school, and there are plenty of teachers. But the teachers, for the most part, do nothing at all. They lie there. They don't, they don't teach. Some of them might even be dead. As I say, there's a surreal turn in this novel. As he says, and this is Jacob himself speaking, we pupils or cadets have really very little to do. We are given hardly any assignments. We are not taught anything. The educators and teachers are asleep, or they are dead, or seemingly dead, or they are fossilized, no matter. In any case, we can get nothing from them. As he asks himself later, where are the teachers here? Is there any plan, any idea of what to do? There's nothing. Either the teachers in our institute do not exist, or they're still asleep, or they seem to have forgotten their profession, or perhaps they are on strike because nobody pays them their monthly wages. Strange feelings seize me when I think of the poor slumberers and absent minds. There they all sit or slump against the walls in a room specially arranged for their repose. These are the teachers in the institute there's no one to teach them really. And what do they learn? They learn nothing in particular. They learn how to follow rules. But these rules are largely decontextualized. They sort of formal principles of action that lack any clear reason or purpose. They exist without enforcement, without force, without transmitting any notion of the proper. There's rule following, but nothing in particular is happening. Nothing in particular is being learnt. At the same time, as he says, we send out our feelings in all directions, gathering experiences and observations. This is the experience, as Tyson E. Lewis, of what he calls studious play, where rules exist without force of meaning, enabling one to send out feelings in all directions in order to observe, think, feel without punishment. Without clear purposes, rules remain detached from specific functionality as tools of socialization and normalization. When pupils obey, they do so as a form of parodic mimicry, introducing a slight gap between the observation of rules and playful appropriation of them. So the school in which this young man, Jakob von Gunten, finds himself is a parodic space. We might dream as well of a parodic university, a university in, in parody, a university in comedy, where our relationship with our teachers is one which is largely lacking. We're allowed to get on with whatever it is we do through a form of studious play. So without the teacher to verify the transmission of traditions, norms, values and principles, there's only the free time and space that remains without destination. As Tyson Lewis says, it is my argument that when the school ceases to test against an intended outcome, the potentiality of whatever emerges from within the free time and space, the potentiality of whatever emerges from within the free time and space. So this idea of whatever, whatever time, whatever space, space and time you can use for whatever you like. 
together, being together in studious play. The result is not euphoria so much as the feeling of being left stupefied without directional guidance. And that word stupefied has an etymological link to the word stupidity and to the word student. Student, stupefied, stupidity, all of them exist together. To be stupefied without direction or guidance. If the typical narrative of learning is one of progressive determination and mastery, then Yakov's narrative is one of increasing stupefaction in light of a world that lacks affordances, that lacks a sense of equilibrium between the habituated body and environmental possibilities, that lacks the lure of, de of desire or interest. So I wanted really just to, to, to use um, this, this wonderful novel by, uh, by Valsa, just to try and open up this sense of the student, the stupid student, the stupefied student, where each time it's a matter of losing orientation, losing directional guidance, where it is not, not, um, not to be understood as going along with the way in which things are, or simply trying to negate the way in which things are. We're not trying to destroy anything. What we're trying to do instead is open up a new relationship to what exists. And that is what is meant by constituent potentiality. It's not a revolution. It's opening up a different relationship with the world around us, a relationship of play, a relationship where we have things in common, we experience things in common. But what we experience fundamentally is free time, free space, space to do whatever, time to do whatever. So I think of um, Jakob von Gunten as opening up a sense of what the university could be, what it might be, what our graduate studies might be in this world that we try to imagine together. So let me stop my presentation of Valsa's work there and ask you whether you have any final reflections or comments. Is there anything we haven't covered, anything we haven't discussed today, anything that's worth underlining? I hope as you, as you gather your thoughts, this has been use for you, useful for you in terms of your academic writing. I suppose one thing that hasn't been said explicitly here, but it's worth underlining, is the idea that self-care is actually something extremely important in any long-term, long-distance studies. The loneliness of the long-distance thinker is something which is really quite serious. And you need to cultivate a sense in which you can give yourself time off for contemplation of an open-ended kind, time off from your work. And I, I, I think I'm always trying to remember, I'm always trying to articulate here, think about these spiritual exercises that one might undergo. Exercises in which you set yourself some task. I'm not sure what it might be. It could be sitting with your eyes closed in front of the sun, going for a walk of some sort, sitting quietly, things of this sort. Build those into your day, into your work day. You know, I think the, the expression came up earlier. I think it was um, Genghis, you mentioned stress, things being stressful is to try and unplug from that stress, from the guilt that you feel. There are exercises you can do, there's all, all, all sorts of sources you can take them from, perhaps focusing on breathing, things like this, which can, which can reduce that stress and turn your, um, your thoughts elsewhere. Yeah, Lisa McKenzie, is the, this is from Nathan. Lisa McKenzie, I forget the name of the book. Um, what's it called? It's a cheap paperback from Poverty, so it's well worth buying. It's a wonderful book. And look at her website in general, Lisa, at Lisa McKenzie. And for, this is the, the question of well-being. For her own well-being, she left Durham University and she went back to her estate and she spent lockdown working with people in that estate and produced different kinds of writing as a result of that, which I actually I've only just remembered today talking to you people, so I haven't looked at that stuff myself. Um, but yes, it's... it's it's other practices, find some other way of, of, of living while doing your study, where your, your, your work is not, the, is not all, is, which allows your work not to be the central thing in your life and stressing over it. Give yourself a different relationship to your work somehow or another. And I say this as someone who um, is pained by what he sees around him in terms of the students who, who study here with me, with, with, other, with other examiners. They're getting, people are getting themselves into terrible stress so you need to be able to take time off. Um, that's part of academic writing. So academic writing includes as part of it, not writing, you know, turning away from writing, um, being even against writing, as Carl was saying.
being against writing in some sense. So that's that's what I wanted to leave you with is that is that sense of the importance of um, of um, a life outside of 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 work, of efficiency, of productivity, of, of operativity. So cultivate inoperativity somehow or another. So thank you, thank you for your comment, Andrea. Thank you for this. Um, yeah, um, comforting sensitivity. These things are very important. MA dissertations are hard enough. PhD supervision, PhD, PhD studies, dissertation. You need to be careful. You, know, you need to be look after yourself. Look after each other. Uh, who was it who said we have to not only um, ask for help? This was um, Genghis, but offer help to others as well. Offer help to others. Um, find help other people around you. Help yourself. Open up these these communal spaces. Um, and thanks for the links here. Nathan's got an interesting space here. The, um, an interesting link here. So thanks all. So I guess we'll we'll leave it there for today. I hope to see you again at other EGS sessions. So thanks very much for coming along and for your for your contribution. Bye bye all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.